Okay, we, we are going to start, I, I think, because it's, uh, almost everybody is, uh, is here. So welcome everybody to this uh, event, which is a series of events that Guillermo has uh, been organizing in different places uh, around, uh, around an experiment that we did. Uh, I mean, the, the, the experiment started like two years ago. Uh, and that's basically what I'm going to explain a little bit is the experiment. The, uh, and then we have invited uh, a large panel of, uh, of people uh, to discuss uh, over the experiment. Uh, so I'm going to explain the early part of the experiment, which uh, was uh, the outcome of a commission from El Croquis uh, nearly two years ago to write something about the current state of architecture. Uh, in general. Uh, <clears throat> so when they uh, asked me to do that, I tried to think what uh, would be relevant to, to do, under what scope uh, could we talk generally about the current state of, uh, of the discipline. And I uh, thought that maybe it could be interesting to address the discipline from, um, from its political stance. And this is something that has been an interest of mine uh, already for, uh, for some time. Uh, <clears throat> uh, and and uh, it, it, it is an interest that became increasingly strong uh, after I realized that uh, in the generation that, that comes after me, uh, I mean, my, my generation was, uh, or, or, or tried to stand in a kind of apolitical, non-political uh, grounds. I mean, I invited Patrick. He was uh, going around saying that he was a Marxist, uh, anyhow, but he was a rare, uh, a rara avis in the, in the landscape. Uh, we were uh, simply mm, trying to avoid positioning ourselves politically and simply engaging with a number of, uh, of things that uh, I think happened in the 90s, uh, which I would say uh, shaped the, the, the discourse, globalization, the race of, uh, of uh, computation as the, as the fundamental tool to, to do architecture. So those were the those were the the issues that uh, we tried to uh, uh, address, and then uh, after a few years, uh, I realized that there were people of a new generation, uh, the generation that maybe now is between 30 and 40 years old, maybe some people a little bit older than 40, <laughs> not 40, or let's say between 30 and 50 years old. <laughs> Uh, uh, that uh, were uh, taking a, a political stance, systematically. And so I, I told the people from the caucus, why don't we do this? Uh, and they say, okay, fine, do it if you want, but make sure that you put this, this, and this guy in the, in the list. Uh, and I said, well, you know, I don't know, these guys are a little bit too old. Some of them went into the, uh, into the, <laughs> into the mix. Uh, maybe they shouldn't have been there. I'm, I'm sure that there are people who should have been there and are not there. Uh, and, you know, the, the, the experiment is, is just to put on the table something that would hopefully uh, initiate uh, a, a discussion about the, engage, the political engagement of the discipline, which is something that, uh, that even that generation that, uh, that I'm referring to, because I, I told the people from El Croquis, I'm, I'm going to I'm gonna try to avoid the, 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 the more established practices and focus on the newer practices that have been more sensitive to, to, to the current uh, situation. <coughs> Of the, of the discipline. So, so that, that's basically how the, the, the experiment uh, went. And then, let me get my notes because uh, I had a few comments that I, I want. So I, I basically made this text that was called uh, Well into the, the 20th, 21st century that was an attempt uh, uh, and a slightly sarcastic attempt, I, I, I admit, because it's also uh, a certain critique uh, uh, to, uh, to the work 
of the new generation. Uh, so it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, an attempt to, to, to place, uh, to place uh, uh, all these different tendencies, uh, but, but also uh, to criticize them to a degree. And, and so that critique is, uh, is uh, I think, is present. If you've uh, read the text uh, throughout the text, but in a, in a kind of ironic uh, manner. <clears throat> but basically, the, the idea was to try to locate the new uh, practices uh, within a number of categories that could be uh, labeled with, um, with uh, terms, with political terms. So activism, fundamentalism, populism, uh, and other uh, interests of the new generation, which I I believe can be des described as uh, seeking a certain uh, political position, <clears throat> but are perhaps not necessarily part of the political lingua, uh, such as historicism or, or well, technocracy is another another possible word, or, or te techno technocratic, technocritic. Some some of these uh, uh, words were were also uh, introduced. Um, uh, skepticism. Uh, neo-historicism were uh, uh, some of these uh, uh, cat uh, categories that, uh, that I came up uh, with. And they were uh, mixed because, uh, I mean, we had already many discussions about, about the content of the, of the text uh, with different people. <clears throat> they were mixed with architectural traits. Uh, and so I, I think that, uh, that perhaps it would be even more interesting that the, the purpose of these sessions that we are doing and, and Guillermo is, uh, is basically organizing in different places uh, uh, is that we will eventually review the diagram that, that he did and that, well, that we did, he did it, he ran it basically and I was like, Looking at it uh, <laughs> like uh, like that, but but the idea is uh, is to keep evolving the diagram uh, in in different ways, and and so uh, mixed or or overlaid with these uh, seven political uh, groupings that I came up with are a number of issues that I think are crossing through all these uh, practices, which are perhaps more. Uh, more architectural. Uh, uh, and the first category is the, the kind of cute activism. I, I called it cute activism because, uh, and, and I, I, but I think that, uh, that uh, in some ways that was deliberately uh, contradictory because activists before were not cute, were kind of macho and kind of black and white and mm, gun metal and, uh, and this kind of uh, aesthetic and suddenly you realize that there is a generation of uh, of people uh, such as um, such as assemble for example I, I i have i can i can read there and i can remember who was <laughs> who was in the in the uh, in the cute activist but but uh, uh, people like uh, <coughs> round labor but round labor is is not necessarily uh, cute uh, I, I think that uh, pv for example is uh, or bauku uh, is also cute, and it also uh, takes a certain, um, uh, not really activist role, but, uh, but certainly a kind of politically uh, um, uh, assertive uh, position. Uh, so, so I was uh, curious to see that uh, there was suddenly a number of people that were claiming a certain uh, political position and then using an aesthetic that was entirely new to the to the to the political modality they they located them, themselves is. Uh, in uh, the second category was the the populists and uh, I uh, included in the populist people like like um, like uh, much to their despair. <laughs> Uh, people like uh, like Biarque or or uh, Minsukcho or Rex or you know these these type of people who who have uh, in a way taken the ideas uh, uh, perhaps of uh, of my generation and taken them farther in the sense that that probably we uh, we 
uh, approach those uh, projects in a more um, uh, guilty, I would say, <laughs> manner, more complex, more guilty, and, and they have managed to streamline the, the discourse uh, in order to be able to communicate much more efficiently. So, so the, in, I call them populists and they com they all complain to me um, uh, systematically. Uh, and, and, and I had actually quite an interesting exchange with, uh, with uh, some of them uh, because they didn't want to consider them, themselves populists. I, I told them I think this is silly. I am very interested in populism. I think architecture should be more populist because one of the problems we have is that we are not able to, to communicate. Uh, so I, I didn't think that the populism was in any way uh, um, uh, equal to Trump uh, or equal to other political movements that uh, are, are, uh, are considered under this, uh, uh, this label. I, I thought that the populism was a way of streamli streamlining the message and and uh, also, in a way, reducing the complexity. Complexity is another one of the more architectural um, uh, uh, qualities, like the cuteness would be one. Of, of Cuteness pervades everybody, pervades the historicists, pervades the activism. Uh, so it, it is quite a, quite a kind of widespread uh, uh, quality of, uh, I think, the new uh, generation. The other one would be a reduction of complexity. If, if my generation was very interested in complexity, formal complexity, uh, I, I think that uh, obviously one of the things that you can see when you look at the current landscape is a tendency towards the reduction of complexity towards uh, uh, forms that are, are much more, much more uh, simple, much more restrained, uh, and. Uh, <clears throat> And so I, I, I want to basically, uh, and I think some of the people that are here who are part of this generation that, that uh, are uh, charted in the, in, in the map uh, uh, will have different uh, uh, positions. Uh, we, can, we can talk about this uh, later on, but I think that there has been a, a, a reaction against complexity, against uh, the parametric, uh, maybe uh, as associated to a certain political uh, stance that many people uh, have um, have taken. Uh, the next category uh, was uh, back to history, and obviously uh, there was uh, <coughs> there was a famous uh, statement by by Fukuyama about the end of history that that uh, became one of the the, the crucial. Uh, uh, documents of uh, <clears throat> of the so-called neoliberal ideology, and and the other thing that you see in in uh, in some of the people that are practicing uh, now uh, is that there is uh, there is a kind of tendency towards uh, retrieving history as a as a realm to operate with, as a realm that uh, would perhaps. Uh, help the discipline to offer a certain level of resistance against the, the kind of fluid, uh, mad rhythm of um, <clears throat> of uh, um, uh, the so-called neoliberal uh, status quo. Uh, so the discipline as a as a piece of resistance, the return to history, I I think is also. Uh, um, a, a tendency that you can see uh, through, and that, uh, that through many many of the of these uh, practices, then there is um, another category that I, I call it the the, the new existentialism, uh, which plays with contingency, with uh, uh, playfulness, and, and and sometimes even dysfunctionality, in which the the kind of determined, uh, planned uh, ambitions, perhaps, of the previous generation and the conviction that uh, we were working in a, in a new situation where the, 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 the kind of technology uh, and globalization processes were going to lead architecture into a new, uh, into a new, uh, new possibilities. Uh, so here we, we see the opposite. We see a deliberate uh, attempt to to remove 
themselves from, from that kind of deliberateness and, uh, and to be simply more, more playful. I think that uh, practices like, uh, like Moss uh, or, or even, even some of the practices that, that uh, are here represented are also um, playing with that, that uh, idea of, uh, of uh, play, even, for example, Office uh, is also somebody who, who um, or, or a group of people that, uh, that play with, uh, with things that are not necessarily uh, deliberate about every one of the moves, simply bring things from history, mix them, and, and, uh, and have this kind of slightly laid back uh, position towards the achievement of a, of a, of a certain new form of, uh, of architecture. Uh, and I think finally, there was the category. Ah, uh, no, there were two more categories. Uh, another one that I call the, the fundamentalists of material resistance, so those people who are much more uh, 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 interested in, in reclaiming uh, the, the, the material uh, presence of the building as an act of resistance again to all these flows of uh, capital that. Uh, that uh, neoliberalism had uh, popularized, and people like uh, Wang Xu, for example, is 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 uh, I think paradigmatic in, in in his architecture, but also the way he explains the architecture uh, as a as a place where the, the the fact of building is the fact that brings a community together that is not driven by the forces of capital. So there's a kind of uh, concentration about the, 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 the materiality of the, of the building that is also uh, resisting as a, as, a, as a political position uh, this, this kind of uh, neoliberal uh, <clears throat> agenda. So uh, Keres, Radic, Studio Mumbai, a number of people are, are, are taking that, that position. I think Assemble, uh, Assemble is uh, also uh, a little bit part of that, although I don't think that they are particularly uh, interested in, in material, but they are definitely interested in, in, in construction. And, and finally, no, no, not finally, I never get to the final one. There, there, are, <laughs> there, are two, there were three more. So, so the, there was the, the, the cosmo, what, what I call uh, the austerity chic or, or the, the, the cosmopolitical, um, the cosmopolitical uh, position that, uh, that uh, is uh, represented perhaps by people like, like Lacaton Vassal, HHF, H Architects, um, mm, and a number of other people that have deliberately tried uh, to take a, 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 a kind of economic uh, approach to, to architecture. Indy is also one of the, the people that will be probably in this, uh, in this uh, category. Uh, and the final one is what I call the critical parametric, which is a number of uh, other people who have been uh, redeploying the, the tools that perhaps the previous generation uh, had used in order to produce more complex forms, more uh, strange uh, architectures, uh, in order to, uh, to produce a certain uh, critique, or, or also to be playful with the same tools that perhaps our generation tried to use in a more, uh, more deliberate uh, manner. And, and so there are people like um, Gramazzi on Kohler, uh, uh, Mark Fornes, Liam, uh, I think, uh, uh, is uh, probably in that, uh, in that uh, category. And, and Eyal, uh, I, I brought the case of Eyal because he's, uh, he's, uh, he's also a kind of local <laughs> from, the, from the AA, uh, as someone who, who has been using those very tools not to produce bigger and more sophisticated buildings uh, for the global capital, but on the contrary, uh, to feed uh, the, 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 the courts, the international courts, uh, through uh, this uh, forensics uh, uh, institution that, that he's created. And so these were the, the, the seven categories in which I tried in the text, which you can you can read it in, in different places, is is around uh, in order to to try to 
put on the table the possibility that that architecture and uh, <clears throat> uh, and politics are discussed in a in a consistent manner. Uh, and and what I hope that that we will be able to discuss later later on is to what degree we succeeded, to what degree uh, we didn't, and we we can uh, obviously revise uh, the categories or or uh, maybe introduce a number of other categories that are transversal to these uh, categories that are more determined by a political um, uh, labeling, uh, kind of uh, from from the political the political uh, language, and and then uh, basically after having written the the, the article. Um, Guillermo, who was then uh, working in my office, uh, was very interested in it and, and was much more knowledgeable than me about guys, new guys in the, in the, in the field. Uh, so I, I asked him to, to try a diagram. And, uh, and so the diagram came out of, of that. Uh, he basically drove the, the experiment of trying to do the the diagram, which, which is one instance of many possible diagrams, we ourselves are not uh, happy. And one of the reasons why we are doing these sessions is that we think that the, the diagram should be the, an object that, that we can keep uh, evolving or, or discussing uh, into version 2.0, 3.0, and, and, and maybe there are a number of uh, other diagrams that, that can happen. So I, I'm going to uh, ask Guillermo to, to, to present the diagram now, uh, and then I will come back and uh, ask some questions, and then I, I hope that uh, the people that are invited will engage in, in answering some, some of these questions. Hello, first of all, thanks Dave for having us here today to present our research about the political re-engagement of the discipline. <coughs> that everything started, as Alejandro mentioned, with the article well into the 21st, 21st century. So it was already like at the end of 2015 when Alejandro sent me the article and he told me, what do you think? Uh, are we forgetting somebody who is relevant? Uh, it's super difficult to classify or to analyze this. And he already, in that, we, we cross emails back and forth, and at that point he already mentioned, why don't we do something like the James diagram? So it was already present since the beginning, and so we were looking at it a little bit, um, from the early diagram from 1971 to the, also we were looking how the, uh, probably James looked at Alfred Barr's diagrams, that all the ways diagrams and maps have been able to, <coughs> have been doing that to classify different tendencies. Um, basically, so we look at it, and at some point we did the diagram, and this was the first version, as Alejandro mentioned, and this was just an attempt to trigger the discussion, to start a debate, and this would so sit these people around here today to see where the discipline is going, if this is useful, are the categories good enough to classify the people, are the adjacencies good, or is it relevant as a tool, or is it not? So this is some of the things that we want to, to achieve. So the, I am going to explain very briefly the experiment. We send everybody who is future in the map, an empty diagram like this one, and a list of the categories. And we didn't want to send them our version so they can position the same freely, or they, they don't have any, any judgment of who is next to it, they are, who are they next to, or so they can position them completely freely, basically. And I'm going to pass through some of the graphical answers that we got, for example. This was one of the more common things. Everybody was positioned in the sense of the center, somehow. And you see this circle that it covers everything, basically or some others were beautiful, like these two dots that we can imagine who can be, for example, is probably from some Japanese guy. <laughs> or somebody who was already like trying to also make an aesthetic claim about it. <laughs> or somebody who positioned every single project in a different political stance, because the office doesn't have a political stance, but it's the projects themselves. That many people still think, and maybe the previous generation was clear on that, as Alejandro probably. 
And then, for example, Chris, who answered us, I want to be 75% historicist, 25% austerity chic. And then after we sent him the, the, the answers, he tell me, now I, I see everybody and I want to be positioned there. And that's his circle. <laughs> and then more center, more center is slightly more funky. I, so people was, or this, for example, was also some of the things that there are two partners, each of the partners position themselves in a position and the practice is somehow in the middle, which is probably true. Or one of the material fundamentalists, probably he was too upset with the pastel tones we were using and he changed the gradient and he positions himself as much in the limit as possible. Or more center, more center. Or the skeptics, who were the first ones to answer, interesting enough, and always accepting more or less their position. And then again, center, center, center. And this was our version, and I think that's enough to present how a little bit was the experiment, and we can open up the discussion with some of the questions Alejandro wants to bring up. Uh, I don't know whether we should, uh, I mean, I, I have uh, a little bit of a kind of historical framing of the, of the, of the discussion that I would like to add, because as, as I was explaining, I think that there is, in the, in the diagram, the attempt to locate the different political categories uh, on, on, different, uh, on, the, on the border of the, of the map. So the, the guys that are closer to the border, theoretically, are more uh, uh, purist, uh, or are more in a kind of pure form. The more they move to the center, the, the, the least uh, maybe determiner. There are all kinds of problems, uh, and we recognize them ourselves. It's, it's, uh, it's just one version. Don't, don't, I mean, there's no point uh, discussing where you are or where you should be. I, I, I mean, we are much more interested in, in seeing whether people see a, a different possibility of, of doing it. There is a problem of adjacency. So the adjacency was set putting, let's say, uh, starting from the technical uh, uh, area at the top, technocritical, technocratic, cosmopolitical, then it derives more towards uh, the austerity uh, shape, which we thought had something to do with the kind of cosmopolitical, like ecological uh, positioning. Then it uh, slips further down to the, to the activists, and then some of the activists are uh, touching the, the fundamentalists, uh, and the fundamentalists then evolve into kind of historicists, uh, which are divided between uh, his new historicist, constitutionalist, and revisionist as, as, as two variations. I mean, we can also think about making different variations of, uh, of, the, of the map. Then we go into the, the skeptics or the, 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 the playful, the contingent uh, position into the populist and back into the technocratic. Now, there are certain uh, positions that are obviously not possible because they, uh, they produce uh, adjacencies that are simply not not viable uh, uh, within the map. Maybe we need to think about a three-dimensional map or, or other means of uh, doing this, which, which we are uh, trying to, to consider. Uh, uh, but I think, for example, when we were doing the map, you remember, we were literally putting the categories of the, of the article, and one of them was cute activists, and at some point we said, let's get rid of the cute. Let's, let's leave, leave it as, as activists, because there are people also perhaps that are not cute, and, and it, Ramlau, it will be example, maybe some. Eh? Ramlau, for example. Exactly. There, there were there were people that were not not cute within the, the activists, but but uh, but I still think that there are, and these are the questions to the to the um, people who who are in, on the table, uh, which is uh, which is uh, that the opposition between the cute, the naive. And the, the the maybe more uh, dark um, dark uh, let's say dystopian um, uh, um, aesthetics of of some people. Uh, then there is the opposition between uh, simplicity and complexity. As uh, and you know, I mean, Liam is here. I, I think that his aesthetics are not cute are more dystopian, but maybe he disagrees. Uh, uh, while, for example, Efren and Cristina are, are uh, complex. Actually, they are one of the people that are 
complex but maybe cute uh, also sometimes. Uh, <laughs> and so I, I think that, that the, the, there could be a number of other uh, classifications that, uh, that we could uh, play with um, uh, uh, that I think need to be reinserted because I think if we are not able to, to insert or to reinsert in the diagram this um, uh, these more architectural uh, qualities of the of the work, maybe we we miss we miss something. That that is something that I have been uh, thinking late, lately, and and also is part of uh, uh, other conversations that that we are having around the the project. Uh, and then and then finally, there is one uh, one uh, subject that that is also very important for me, and I think very important for for the the AA and. And this is why I ask uh, Patrick to be uh, here today as a, as a kind of uh, polemicist, uh, uh, polemicist engaged with, uh, with the kind of political um, uh, statement <clears throat> and a kind of dinosaur from my age uh, who is kind of looking at the, at the, <laughs> at the older, uh, at the younger generation uh, perhaps uh, can, can be Interesting, but but I think that what what for me is interesting of uh, asking Patrick to be here, and, and we will not have the, the the thing has been organized as if we are going to have a conversation at the end. I think that will be a, a mistake, and we are I, I I mean I think it will be more interesting if he is simply part of the of the discussion on the on the table. But uh, but I I think one of the the most interesting things of what happens to to Patrick lately is that. After having declared himself a Marxist and, and being in the in the text, I, I sent the text to him and, and he told me, "Well, you know, it's very nice, but actually, I'm no longer a Marxist. Now I'm a radical liberalist." <laughs> and uh, and so uh, I and and he and then and then we met in by chance in in Montreal, and he said that he was reading uh, Hayek, uh, which is kind of pretty, you know, hardcore stuff. Uh, and I was quite impressed with uh, uh, with that, and I I would like to uh, place uh, this discussion of the of the plan and the non-plan as another one of the oppositions that happen that can, is is uh, is weaved through the through the through the different uh, practices that that I, I I think we could maybe maybe address, and I would like to make a, a, a quick history of. Plan and non-plan, uh, uh, because this, this is a history that is is very much related to uh, to the institution, and, and I think is is, uh, is is quite an, an interesting uh, discussion to to have. I mean, when he told me that he was reading Hayek, then 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 obviously Hayek is one of the guys who was least interested interested in in design. So for him, design was something that we should not do. Design is something that. Soviet planners were doing was were doing so uh, planning designing was bad. Keynes was bad because he was planning the economy, he was directing the economy, um, and uh, what Hayek obviously was proposing was that the economy is not directed, uh, uh, and that uh, that uh, things happen democratically. And that's basically the word he, he uses. He says the planning, the design, is not democratic because it means that somebody is making decisions for everybody else. And he basically proposed a number of, of things. Then he went uh, to the university. He was at the LSE. He went to the University of Chicago. He was maybe one of the guys, he was one of the guys uh, who founded the Montpellerin Society from which Milton Friedman was one of the members, and obviously, so you know basically what lineage uh, he uh, he created, <clears throat> and I think that is worthwhile to think that that these people that were in London in the 50s, uh, uh, Hayek and, and company, and then moved to to Chicago and became in, in phenomenally important in shaping uh, the politics of countries, uh, uh, complete. Uh, Entire countries uh, were uh, perhaps connected to architects like Alison and Peter Smithson. So Alison and Peter Smithson were at the time talking about the as found. They were talking about 
uh, design is a dirty word. That was a statement by Alison and, and Peter Smith. So, the, so they, they were interested in the, in the vernacular. They were, they were interested in engaging with uh, uh, the, the, the contextual, with the, the collage, uh, the whole uh, uh, scene of the, of the independent group, uh, Paolozzi, etc., etc., were part of, of the idea that design is not, not, uh, not good. Uh, and that we should basically learn from Las Vegas. So from, from there you go to Venturi and Scott Brown, who are also part of, the, of, the, of, the, of that idea of an architecture that is not uh, planned. Uh, Cedric Price, Peter Hall, Rainer Banham, all these people are in some ways part of that lineage of, the, of, the, of Hayek, which suddenly Patrick was, uh, was uh, reminding uh, me of, uh, and that, uh, that uh, evolved, you know, Jane J Jacobs, uh, Bob, Bob Goodman, after the planners, the book after the planners. So planning is bad. Planning is something, planning and, and design is something that, uh, that uh, is bad. And, and, uh, and so all this uh, continues, goes on to the kind of neoliberal uh, uh, state of Clinton and Blair and uh, and other I mean I think REM is is uh, that kind of conflict between the plan and the non-plan is very much also part of uh, of uh, of his question uh, to the to the discipline uh, so I mean that I'm explaining why Patrick is here as a di dinosaur but also as somebody who who has uh, shifted between a Marxist position and a, and, a, and a radical neoliberal uh, or liberal radical liberal uh, position and that uh, uh, is uh, curiously uh, 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 I mean I, I don't think that you would say design is a dirty word would you so I mean in some ways that that said so everybody comes here and, uh, and then we can start discussing <laughs> You can start answering to, to that position, yes, and, and yes. then we can move uh, through the different uh, and, and simply ask them to criticize the, the attempt to, or, or to make some statements about politics and architecture, which, which I think that's what, what we want to discuss. Sure. Well, thanks a lot, first of all, for inviting me as, as a dinosaur here. Yeah, I'm not sure if I'm happy with that role. <laughs> Um, particularly since I've reinvented myself recently. <laughs> but there's also deep continuities I will come to. But I think, first of all, I notice with this, this diagram, and that um, is troubling, that there is no, my position isn't there. It's not that my person isn't there, but that whole position isn't there. Everything here is either apolitical, or if it is to a degree political, is anti capitalist, left oriented. And that's there's truth to this. This discipline is incredibly biased, and I think behind the curve, with an enormous amount of inertia, with respect to um, a political discourse which has moved on strongly. And um, the comrades of yesteryear, which I've been with, they're mostly moved into that new space of libertarian politics. And uh, if you look at where the tech sector is, is going, what the political affiliations are in California with all the startup culture and tech mm -hmm. gurus and that flourishing. It's precisely where I'm moved in terms of my, my politics. And that's a big gap and omission in that diagram. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, uh, populism, people start to refuse. And if you had neoliberalism, nobody would have wanted to be in there. I would have been happily 
<laughs> place myself, but I'm, for me, neoliberalism, as you, as you pointed out, is maybe not uh, radical enough because it smacks too much of the current status quo, which for me is, is, is problematic, and I want to move, probe further further degrees of freedom. When it comes to the concept of design, uh, design is not a, is a negative word for me. Yeah, maybe this idea of, of a central plan and um, the hubris of trying to redesign and, uh, um, a reality from scratch, kind of false utopianism, that is discredited. And that was also, uh, with the discipline that was absorbed. Uh, all the names you mentioned, starting with Smithsons and Jane Jacobs in particular was very explicitly in literal libertarian politi poli uh, politics based. The others maybe more intuitively now can also add, for instance, Rudowski's Architecture Without Architects and this, 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 this idea that um, instead of design, we should also look at bottom-up processes, evolutionary processes, and actually they are now folded in to kind of a design process. And Hayek also wasn't so much against planning per se, he was against this kind of constructivist reinvention of all social relations and was banking on private planning. And that's also something which created London, for instance. So there is something where individuals and private um, entities have plans and these plans need to be coordinated and they're, in his terms are coordinated through market processes and the intelligence and information processing capacity of this eye. He, he's bringing out and, and I think is, 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 is to be reflected. Yeah, so... Um. Uh, incidentally, you know, I, around 2002, when I was running the Berlage, I tried to organize a conference on politics, and I did organize a conference po on politics, and I couldn't find any architect who would declare himself right-wing. <laughs> Nobody. Do you know anybody? <laughs> you, do, who would say that they are right-wing? Well, in Spain. But, but yeah. I know a few in Spain, more. In Spain, there are a few. It's I, true. But they're, they're kind of uh, 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 theoretically ignorant. Uh -huh. I'm saying somebody with... Uh, with uh, uh, <laughs> Actually, I, I found one uh, uh, years later. Really? Yeah. Who's that? Rudy Ricciotti. Do you know this guy? Mm. Yeah. French from Marseille. But I know a few people. Maybe um, ignorant degree. <laughs> I, I know a few people who say they are, who take the apolitical stance, and that nearly implicitly is a pro-establishment stance. And if you probe a little bit, uh, and they wouldn't want to come out with this, I know that certainly that Jeff and Peter Eisenman, Jeff Kipnis, Peter Eisenman, also Greg Lynn are not in any way left-wing. And if it comes out, they're more on a. Uh, center-right position. They wouldn't admit to this of, because it's such oh, a taboo in the field. Nobody, I mean, <laughs> we know that, uh, that uh, many of us may be right-wing. Right? <laughs> <laughs> but I don't like the left-right uh, distinction so much because it has a lot of faults. Mm. Faults. It's a false dichotomy for me. So, Liam, do you want to say something? Or do you have uh, some... Uh, yeah, I mean, maybe to start, um, the future of uh, architecture is, is, is very much a sausage party, right? Um, uh, I mean, I wonder, is that a coincidence? Or like, how many of the diagram are uh, female architects versus male architects? How did we die? Yeah. Because we're like, I'm just, we're a gang of, of men. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, Christine is you know, fighting Christina the fire. There, yeah. um, but I imagine, is that just a coincidence of planning and people that pulled out? Or is that two, just... Two women cancelled last week. Two, two women cancelled. It's okay. All right. Okay. Okay. Well, just, it just should be noted. Yeah. Okay. Um, so fe feminist, maybe, is a category that is not... Uh, <laughs> but actually, I think the cute is a little bit the kind of feminization. <laughs> Dude. Shoot. As, as you like. Anyone. <laughs> Just miss me. <laughs> right. Um, well, I might... <laughs> but, uh, anyway, I think that should be noted as a, as a starting point, I suppose. Um, uh, the interest, my, my interest in the diagram was the things that um, 
maybe it starts from that, that first question of, of the female representation on it, but, but also think the things that are outside it or the things that you're not including in it. Um, like, I'm interested in a separate, smaller circle that might sit down next to it, which might be the escapist category, or people that have in some way studied architecture but have found a way to leave um, and gone on to various successful things that I would argue were also um, in large part due to their training and their base within the discipline anyway. Um, uh, so I think that's a really interesting category. You know, I'm thinking about um, uh, like the, the concept artist for Blade Runner 2, Victor Martinez, was trained as an architect. Joseph Kaczynski, um, now a Hollywood director, was an architect from Columbia. Tom Ford, Ice Cube, um, uh, craft work, uh, the queen of the Kingdom of Jordan, um, all had lives of archi as architects. Um, uh, uh, and then went on to, to other kind of disciplines. So I think that's an interesting uh, trajectory to start to explore. And equally within that, I would stick another circle in the middle of your circle, which is kind of the outsiders, which is people that weren't trained as architects, but now occupy fairly central roles within the discipline, right? These are the people that pop up in every lecture that you see in a building like this one. You know, the number of people I've, I've, I've seen slides of Velasquez to, to talk about light, or Ridley Scott and Blade Runner, um, or Kanye West, you know? Like, um, people that um, have no, you know, are totally outside of the, the discipline, but exert such influence within it um, that they can't be ignored within the diagram. Um, uh, and maybe that's kind of mirroring my own career trajectory, but I just think that, um, that when we're trying to categorize the discipline, we can't just solely look within it. We have to look either at the people that have moved outside of it or the people that were outside of it but we've brought into it for whatever reason. Uh, uh, just uh, as a kind of... Um, uh, also an anecdote, I have got complaints from uh, some people who are, uh, actually, I mean, I, I don't think that she will mind to, to say it, but uh, Eva French had told me, so why people like me are not there? Hmm. Like somebody who has been educated in, uh, and, and I, I think that uh, this, this was something that we did consider at some point, like kind of people who are active, who are trained as, uh, as architects, but are, are uh, active through a number of other, other fields. And maybe, in, maybe out of uh, kind of Spanish conservatism, <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, we decided to, to constrain the, the, the people in the list to those who were involved with spatial practices. Uh, because we also want, I mean, uh, you, you can, you know, as you say, Tom Ford and whatever, and uh, I think that, that if we had uh, in, in, uh, included, if, if we had been so inclusive, I think, mm. we perhaps would have lost the potential of trying to uh, say something about the discipline. Obviously, whether we like it or not, this diagram mm. is finally for insiders of the discipline. Mm. Mm. Yeah. I mean, that, but that, we had but that's this discussion saying, at the ETH yeah. two weeks ago. Yeah, Cause that, but that's saying something about the discipline, right? That's saying that, um, that's, that's, that, that that's dismissing the things that might be outside it that contaminate it, in a way, like de deliberately. Yes, but I mean, okay. you, are, you, you have uh, stated mm. many times that you don't want to make buildings. Yeah. Uh, and there yeah. are a number of other people who are, have kind of uh, uh, tangential mm. practices. The reason why you are here, <laughs> <laughs> and we have not excluded you from the, the, the diagram, uh, despite the fact that you don't do buildings, yeah, is that I think yeah. that your practice in particular is very spatial. So, so, yeah, so totally. is yeah. so is Eyal. Eyal doesn't do uh, buildings, mm -hmm. uh, but but finally there is a kind of concentration on on geometry and uh, and kind of uh, uh, formal uh, qualities of things that say Eva's uh, role. Doesn't, doesn't do. Even mm. I mean, and she may be incredibly influential mm. in the in the discipline, but we were interested in the practices, and that was the reason why uh, why we excluded. Not because we don't think they are important. Mm -hmm. Not with, 
not because we don't think they are relevant for the for the debate and and would be here and eat us up if uh, <laughs> if, if if they were here uh, uh, but because we were trying to locate uh, uh, practices fundamentally that, that's that's the argument and mm -hmm. I and mm -hmm. I you know uh, all I'm telling you is that that was not innocent that mm -hmm. was deliberate mm -hmm. and. Uh, and, and we did it because there, there, was, there were set, certain reasons for, for doing it. Whether they were or not the right reasons, the, it's important to, to, to notice, sure, I think. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. Indeed. <laughs> um, so, I think this, uh, this debate is super important. Um, so we are right now living in a period of Trump, which is uh, driving uh, racism, uh, violence. After Brexit in the UK, racial attacks increased massively across the UK, doubled. You've got a situation of Marie Le Pen polling 35% of the French population, the National Front, in France. At the same time, there's a rise, in whether it's Modi government in India, or whether we're seeing a phenomena of actually how power and tyranny, I would argue, is starting to concentrate in a way that's not done. And I think the conversation of bringing politics and architecture back together is fundamental. And I'm firstly glad for the first time we're starting to have a debate about it. Secondly, I would say that, and I think it's a serious issue, not a bullshit issue, it's a real issue. People's lives are on the line. There are people probably no more than six miles away from here who are sleeping in sl shift work in rooms, right? In rooms, they're sleeping six hours in shift work over 24 periods in places like Southall. You've got issues, real issues, around the role of the built environment and what justice it provides. So I think the, the, uh, putting down the idea of politics and architecture is foundational and foundationally important. Number two. I think, um, I think, Patrick, your position on saying you're ahead of the curve, I would argue otherwise. I would say the rise of startups was actually a 10-year-old debate. That's exactly where we were 10 years ago. I think the rise of high capitalism, venture capitalism, was actually a pretty old debate now. I think if you look at the rise of stuff like blockchain and cryptocurrencies, and if you look at the rise of a new, new commons, the blockchain is fundamentally an architecture for a new commons at a technical level. I think we're starting to live in a completely different paradigm. If you compare that with the rise of universal basic income and new policies that are starting to fundamentally challenge the notion of actually what the economic infrastructure of society can be, I think we're starting to be in a new paradigm. If you even conceptualize the notion of a human being, as a body, actually the reality is we know increasingly in epigenetics terms, the body is not just you, but your relationship in context, both in time through your parents. We know your mind is not in your brain, but is a social process. The, the illusion of the individual is just that, it's an illusion. So science is leading us to start to understand the world beyond the idea of objects and singularities and single individualistic frameworks. So in this, a new politic is being born. And a really radical, interesting politic is being born. Now the question is, do architects have a framework or a way to view into this? And I think this is the most important period. I think there is a new architecture of a new politic being born, which transcends left and right, which transcends this notion of capital versus uh, of co co uh, communism. I don't think that's where we're going. I think there's something else emerging. And architecture, to be relevant, has to start to comprehend this, not aligned to old dinosaur forces of capital. That isn't how it's going to be. I think there is a challenge for a new discourse on the table. And I think places like the AA should be advancing this new politic and starting to advance a new discourse around this politic by understanding what's coming. So, I think that's what I think. I, so the diagram, I think, is a provocation. You know, I think it's interesting. I, I'm grateful that it's been able to bring this to the table. For that, I am grateful. Whether you ask me to look at the categories, I think, yeah, whatever. But I think the real value is this. 
the real value is that AA is holding this conversation and you've been able to convene it. And I think that is super important. For that, I thank you. Chris. <laughs> you are you're a historicist. Yes, that's right. Yeah. And I think, are you happy with that? Um, <laughs> actually, I am. I, I, I am. Oh, I I'm happy. And, and, and I think after some discussion with Guillermo and you, I think it fits quite well. But before I get into my category, because uh, that's the category I've read most about, uh, and if you actually look at the diagram, it actually has the most concentration of the new generation, right? If you take the skeptic contingent and the new historicists, mm -hmm. they constitute the densest amount of new practices. And I think there's a reason for that. But before I go on to what I think about the reason for that and the way in which you describe this category, I think where I find missing uh, in your description of the experiment, I think you haven't put enough uh, emphasis on distinguishing uh, the political as an idea that allows coexistence, right, to be possible. That is to say that the political is an idea that resolves conflict. Right? Versus, let's say, politics as a process and activity to resolve conflict. Right? So that's one of, on the one hand, we have politics in terms of how we resolve conflict as a method, and the other one is the idea that allows coexistence. Because I think this is both important. And if I were to say that the political as the idea that allows coexistence to happen, it is essentially, I'm quoting Chantal Moff, right? And I think it is one of the most uh, uh, way in which I think as architects we could take that idea. And I think when, when, an, when an architect, let's say for my generation would say that if we are political, I think we are not political in the sense that you and Patrick has described it, I'm left, I'm right, I'm neoliberalist, I'm Marxist. But I think more in the sense that we recognize that as architects we actually have to deal with conflicting demands. We have to deal with a whole range of stakeholders. And I think architecture becomes most operative when it is able to accommodate this difference, right? And allow this difference to coexist or at least brush up against each other conspicuously. <laughs> so that's I wish you could have spoke a little bit better. Yeah, but I, 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 I get a little bit, you know, this is the kind of thing that I would have said. So I would have said the same thing, oh, the world is complex, we architects uh, are embedded in this kind of field of, uh, of uh, political powers and we need to make a decision and try to make them converge. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and you know what? People like uh, PV, who was also invited but couldn't yeah. be, be here, would say, yes, but that's too easy because that doesn't, that you guys, and he was referring sure. to, to my sure. generation, yeah are just not stating a political stance. Yes, you but are playing, you're surfing, you are kind of pliant, you can, you can go one way or another. Yeah. And so I was expecting your, mm. or, 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 or sure. your generation sure. to come up with that political yes. stance, yes. but you are kind of coming back to, to, to this, a similar type of no, statement. Not entirely, because I think maybe what you're saying is that it's apolitical, right? It's essentially what would have been discussed in the late 90s, early 2000s, the post-critical. It was named post-critical then. You're naming it post-political yeah. now. PV, I know him very well, you know, love his work, you know. As you know, he's even my PhD supervisor. Yes. So there's many things I agree with him. What I don't agree with him is that, is that position even possible? Right? Is, is, or is, will that position lead architecture to merely being a representation uh, or a declaration of political position rather than something that actually makes meaningful changes on the ground? Right? So, so that's, that's, my, that's, my, that, that's my response to, to, to what you've said. So yeah, I, but that, but I'm not saying that it's e either a PV position or your position. I think a lot of us who are practicing now as my generation, I think, of course, we have our own political views, right? Mm -hmm. But we also practice within a, a, a framework in which we recognize that today <coughs> the condition is more heterogeneous, right? And in that sense, as architects who need to operate in this condition requires that awareness that we need to accommodate these differences, right? And that doesn't mean that we're apolitical. But so, so is it possible for, for architects to have a political position? Or Absolutely. Or simply, uh, but meaningful, like, like yeah. you're saying, oh, oh, you're not. I, can, I, I may vote Theresa May, but, yes. uh, but then I'm doing architecture. Or, 
uh, and, and it, they are, there is a kind of distance between your political beliefs and the architecture that you practice. No, I think they are, they, no, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that, of course, we, at the end of the day, I, as an architect, I feel that you cannot practice in a vacuum, right? From yourself or from the context in which you are. So the work that I do, the writings that I do, the, the opinions that I say, is an accumulation of all my experiences, right? Political experience, cultural, social experiences. So I cannot see how that can be disassociated in a sense that you say, if I would, may, I, I can do another type of architecture. No. All I'm saying is that I think in practice, I think it's not as simple to say that if, I, if I'm right-wing, I vote right-wing, there is a right-wing architecture, and I do right-wing architecture. I think that's too reductive. So what do you think about that? Uh, can I come in this week? Yeah, I have very clear views on this. Um, in terms of professional practice. Patrick, otherwise we'll just fucking go home. I mean, it's like, it's really, I mean, you know, like, come on. Uh, what's the problem? Who are you? Okay. Sorry, who are you? We haven't been introduced. Uh, Adam. Oh, you're Adam. Yeah. Okay. Now look, I think I think there's um, it's really valuable what you say, Chris, and I think it just needs maybe a theoretical framework because I see you in call for you know a contingent uh, set of realities and dealing with all fronts, and I, in fact, I think architects are in the lead on that and leading politics, which is stuck in a different world, and. Um, I'd say, you know, my excitement about the, the diagram is that I find it interesting, and when I came to think, oh, why, why can't I put myself anywhere, actually it came to the conclusion that the, the world view on which it's based is fundamentally inadequate and um, out of date. And, and actually, you know, so, the, and it's all premised on a kind of standard economic model, neoliberal view, if you like. And um, I'm not an economist, and I'm not even an analysis, but um, uh, for example, I've been reading a, a great book called Donut Economics by Kate Raworth. And I think it's really fascinating. I think it really shows that architects are in the lead, because um, if you look at the standard, I'm sorry, it's going to be a discourse into economics, which I'm absolutely not qualified to talk about. But if you look at a kind of standard economic model, um, which includes the Hayek and the neoliberal model, but it includes Marxism as well, um, you know, it deals with, um, it, it excludes huge amounts of really significant things in everyone's life. So it deals with, you know, consumers and producers, it deals with business and, you know, individuals, but it doesn't deal with the care economy of how people, you know, get brought up. And, you know, one economist said, uh, you know, what would you, what use would your workforce be if they weren't toilet trained? Uh, it, so it doesn't deal with the you know, care economy. It doesn't deal with the commons, all those things that we hold in common and share, and were typically derided by mainstream economics, especially the neoliberal economics. So they called the commons tragic, as if shared ownership could only be inefficient and useless. But actually, we know it's extremely efficient. It's extremely essential. And, and it's exciting and valid. I mean, it's like, it's right now. It's, it's the thing that Cindy's talking about. It's like, you know, Wikipedia. These are, these, are, these are the kind of emergent, exciting technologies. And it also, crucially, that, 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 that traditional model of economics doesn't deal with the, the Earth as a finite system. So, you know, when the impact of the humans were, was small compared to the abundance of the earth or whatever, it didn't matter. You could ignore that effect on climate, on the, on the earth system. But now humans have a very large impact. Actually, any world, so any world view that excludes the care economy, the, the commons, and the earth as a finite system will, will, will be a very weird view of the world. And that's why when you look at it from a kind of traditional ideological perspective of kind of economics, which is right, left, capital, or whatever, the world starts to look really, really hard to understand. And then all these positions look hard to understand because actually not, they're not positions. But I think when one starts to embrace a kind of economics of that there is, you know, four economics, there's the care, there's the commons, there's the state, and there's also business and the market in place there, and you would have to have all four of those, and you would always want to. You wouldn't want to be in a world that didn't have one of those. And then, to me, that maps quite 
uh, clearly onto the position of architects working in the world where you engage with the state as a completely valuable player. You're engaged with the commons and the shared collective as a completely valid and kind of thing. And with business and the market and with the household economy of, of people's actual kind of altruistic transactions. Mm. And therefore, actually, um, there's a much greater commonality, I think, between a lot of those practices, which are, I see them as a kind of set of diverse experiments all trying to find their way into this incredibly exciting kind of almost scary kind of new you know, world of 21st century. And I thought, you know, the article is also kind of slightly seeped in pessimism, as if, you know, what do we do after capitalism? And it's like, no, 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 it's, it's, like, it's amazing what's happening, or the change is what's happening. And, you know, actual traditional economics hasn't caught up, traditional politics haven't caught up, but I think what's interesting is this bunch of architects are actually part of this kind of sifting, testing, finding a way. Um, so and, and so I guess I feel much more. So I'm not that really bothered where uh, I would be placed on the on the on the chart because actually I feel much more commonality with nearly everyone on that little chart. It's also that it's an interesting like a little petri dish, and we're all in there. A little <laughs> bubble, and there's all the shit around. There's all the rest of the world. It was like all the shite happening in the rest of the world. But but I mean, so so where are you? <laughs> well, well, luckily, I, I mean, didn't, I, we, did, I, luckily we, I didn't understand we, no. the, the category I was in, which I thought, that's fine, I'm, I go on intuition, not, not analysis, no, no, but, I mean, so I'll where, do with that. Where, where are you more, more generally? Uh, I mean, you, you say that there are a number of things that are very interesting that are happening out there that maybe are common to, to all these, uh, these practices, but the question is, or, or the question that, that brought us uh, first to do the diagram was to ask in what way these things are, or, or the politics behind these issues, are shaping architecture? Well, so I think there will be a there, kind of frust shared any... frustration about the kind of traditional politics on offer, and that, that dichotomy of left or right, mm -hmm. when, you know, a kind of, okay, what's an anarchist then? Is that kind of the liberal right, or is it no, but actually, there's, there's you no know, left, left and right here. Yeah, there are the, political modalities. Yeah. There are, there are ways in which you communicate with your constituency or with, uh, with uh, your colleagues in the, in the profession. And so what we were trying to do here is to initiate a conversation that would create a certain discipline about talking about politics within architecture. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure that by saying that uh, there, there is a care economy that is very important and there are commons and there are state uh, we are. We know these things are there. We know that these things are important. I don't think that anybody in the table would deny that. But the question is, how do how do these things? Uh, how are these things brought to architecture, to the discipline of architecture? And and you know, you uh, can, you can say, well, I don't give a shit about the discipline of architecture. That's fine. That the experiment was that to, to try to bring those issues into the discipline. I mean, I mean, can I come in? I would, first of all, I want to agree with Adam with these reminders. Um, but I think I want to address your question, which was, uh, how about architecture? Can architects be political? And my, argue, uh, my suggestion is that in terms of professional practice, um, we're not politically active. We're not politically innovative. We're not politically critical. And if you go through the great architects around of, of, of the last hundred years, through all of them, uh, whether it's uh, Gropius, Mies, Korb, but also even somebody like, and th there's an exception like maybe it's Hannes Meyer with respect to his rhetoric, but recent, all the architects you've talked, we were up by political, all the deconstructors, whether it's Gary, Himmelblaus, Ardid, Rem Kolas, Reglin, uh, everybody who is taking a stake in, in producing the built environment is, can't afford to let a own personal political position get in the way. And if projects, and to the extent that they become political, it's the politics of the client and the micropolitics of the client which will be criticized. And these projects in the political domain are attributed to those clients. And so that's, I would say, in terms of professional practice. When it comes to uh, the discourse and academic reflection about where architecture is going, and, and uh, which, um, what we 
would pres this is forward looking and we have to speculate about what where society evolving positively and we need to step, define some kind of notion of a politically progressive trajectory there we start to get into dispute um, uh, where this is going and where, where it should be going to some extent. And there you also have disputes, like you've had the disputes at the Bauhaus between figures like Hannes Meyer. Uh, he excited the students and they started to push against somebody like Gropius and Mies and there was a real conflict there. But when it comes to the work, this doesn't show. This is more oriented, where society going, where should be society going? And I think uh, for most of the part, and I also have to distinguish like this, if I come establish a certain political profile uh, in the field, it is in, in the discursive field, and it can't be on the professional. Uh, that is just suicidal, that's just, in, in a professional capacity, one just simply has to accept, like Adam has suggested, uh, uh, legitimate, as legitimate, Processes which allocate land, resources, and uh, articulate briefs, and then one addresses them, and by that very token, one has accepted them. Maybe one can notch and 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 refine and, and help a client to to see uh, what one considers a more progressive potential of that trajectory. But when, these are nuances, and one can stand against. So this whole idea of a, of an architectural activism, I think, is is is, is highly. Uh, uh, Delusory acceptance in a position of exceptional, marginal, discursive projects. And I've been uh, uh, on the scene for, for quite a while when we had that strong repitalization of, 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 of the discourse here at the school and elsewhere. We were on the defensive. Our generation was apolitical and we got things done. And the whole parametrism group, what you call technocritical, are essentially apolitical. But the school, the students, there was political firm, uh, fermentation, there was, well, there was, we had, a, we, we experienced a lot of social economic and political upheaval, and it took us quite a while, it took me quite a while to say, hey, we need to, we need to come out. It is disruptive to our project, but we need to start taking a stance. So I've been repoliticized also, and I'm willing to, and, and, and happy to have the discussion, and then joining this discussion, what's progressive, what's moving, uh, in arenas like this, while in a professional capacity that's not on the table. Uh, and when, once I've re-entered this, and why I also was warding it off before, that, that I'm very, very at odds with the general thrust of where this politicization went post-2008 through Occupy Movement and so on. It went further left. It, we, we have an incredibly anti-capitalist and, and left bias in our field in all those who consider themselves political, and that's what I have to struggle with and, and, and come out against, and, uh, uh, and don't want to be put into categories like right wing, and these left right uh, categories are, are, are highly problematic. And so that's why I want to push, push down and say, so I, I embrace the, the, the ability in a non, no bullshit political discussions, but with more pol truly political categories which aren't quite on that, on that chart. So there isn't, where is the Marxist? Are they still around? Are people still believing in the socialist project? Or is it a kind of radicalized Keynesianism which people buy into? Is there Corbynites here? And what is he actually about? Or are we talking about um, a kind of um, um, a regulated capitalism? And that's why I want to ask India as well, where he's a bit vague with respect to his, his alluding to something like Bitcoin, which in fact was directly inspired by Austro-Libertarian economics. Um, and I still believe that the, the scene that I've been talking about has libertarian uh, insights and biases. So we, uh, this idea of new commons, I agree with that. I'm highly skeptical, by the, way, by, by the way, on the kind of universal basic income. And maybe you can come in, where do you see it? Where, where, where do you see more concretely so, political alignment with respect to these tendencies you see, because so I talk about universal basic income, this for me is a kind of, uh, goes back into a kind of socialist project. Where are you drawing these income from in this redistributional uh, economy? Is that the state with, the, with, the, with, this, with, 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 with backed up by, by handcuffs and, and the prison system to, to draw these resources together? Uh, so, so that's my challenge to you. But I, went, I think we need to uh, shift beyond these kind of softy categories, let's say, into more hardcore political categories. 
I would like to disagree uh, a little bit. I think, uh, I, mean, I think uh, our generation uh, was facing a, a former generation was like having a kind of completely dichotomy, completely separation between practice and political idea. So uh, somehow, if, I'm, if you're reading our generation, I'm reading yours as someone that were incapable to, you know, to permeate through architectural decisions their political stances. And uh, for me, this is problematic. I think, uh, well, it was problematic, you know, when I was like a younger, maybe, right? In the sense that, you know, there was a discourse was clearly leftist, clearly, you know, in categories that were like a really, really stable, but it was a practice that was not uh, somehow reflecting that discourses, right? And it was like mainly through theory that was like uh, somehow done in that time. And a theory was almost inaccessible, kind of difficult to read, and not engaging with the rest of the, of the world, I would say, right? And understanding the rest of the world as the thing that is not included in this circle, that is still is a circle with a center uh, surrounded by words describing the discipline which I think, uh, you know, in my, in my opinion, is something that a lot of people in there is trying to avoid, you know, as the, the still center in the discipline discourses, right? So in understanding that there's a separation of the, of the discipline itself, of the, of the decision that you can do, the things that you're, like, doing on an everyday basis, the way you're treating the clients, the, the clients that you're taking, as uh, someone that uh, you can deal with, uh, the, efficient, the design decisions even, the, the softwares that you're using, and so on and so forth. And for me, or for us, this is not an innocent thing. It's not a naive discussion. So it's not a naive kind of a thing. It's something that you can have an stance whenever you're making every single decision. You know? And you, I mean, our, this side of the table at least, you know, uh, our opinion is that uh, there is a possibility of introducing certain kind of uh, discursive Maybe not totally and literally, you know, related with the practice, but there is a certain level of, the, of discourse that could be permeating a kind of certain, you know, a, a critical position. I wouldn't say political because we are all political. That's clear. We are all participating in, in the police, in the creation of the commons, and all these things that were committed. Obviously, when there are opinions constantly, but a certain critical stance through architectural decisions. Even not, you know, doing buildings or not having conventional clients or not conventional processes and so on and so forth. And I think that, in my opinion, is the difference, you know, of this generation with the previous ones. You know, they were accepting, right? So that, that, that's something that I will, uh, would like to introduce in the discussion. Second is the, um, uh, the way this, this, uh, these things can be really reintroduced into practice, right? Um, it is funny enough that the category which are really we are really close to in the diagram. By the way, we didn't position ourselves. We we didn't want to position ourselves basically, and we didn't rely to it basically. Is technocratic, which is the the, the 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 one that is not having anyone. Almost there is one pe one person that I don't know personally, right? Only one, and I think that that is something to be really. <laughs> it is. Pretty interesting this this point, right? That no one wanted to be positioned in the because it's the, the, the thing that I'm referring to, this this incapability of throughout design decisions, throughout everyday decisions I was writing here to what kind of tools are you are you using to to, to face your, your everyday decisions? So it, it is pretty interesting that no one wanted to be there. And and no one was falling into this category. Uh, my, my second comment on the diagram itself <clears throat> is that how these uh, this, um, somehow categories, so history, uh, material, uh, activism, um, the cuteness that you were referring to, the austerity, and, and all these categories are, if there are, or they can, be uh, tools for this kind of political per permeation into reality, right? Um, and my third comment, coming from from this part of the of the of the table, would be if this diagram shouldn't be about the reconnection of the discipline with other things, which I think most of the names in there are about. So the the reconnection of the discipline with the world. So 
or, or understanding that through architectural decisions you can you know, have a position. Not totally political. I, 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 oh, I have something that I, I have to, to say, right? Maybe a critical kind of point of view uh, towards how architecture has been uh, somehow uh, done or, or performed but and what is the role of, of us, you know, as, as, you know, as someone that has a critical position. Can I just say really briefly what I feel? These are characterizations of various uh, practices underway in terms of their approaches, their dis design philosophy, the way they see themselves in their practice. Maybe, what, but they're not political categories. So my proposition would be, where would they self-locate? And maybe they can't. On a series of real um, meaty political categories, which I would say includes things like socialist, if there's anybody still, socialist slash Marxist, would be somebody who's more social democratic, uh, somebody who would be more neoliberal, but under representative democracy uh, and with the role of the state, or somebody who would be, um, in my, but why I'm going for anarcho-capitalist, very, very small or disappearing state, or there's also some groupings, although there's, who would characterize as left anarchism, a kind but, of Komsky you're, you're, and the accelerationists on this camp. So these are, yeah. I don't know how to order these. No, I, know I don't want to necessarily order in the, in the, in the left-right spectrum, but, but this is a kind of set of categories I know of would, would be political positions one could s t take. Maybe that's comprehensive, unless somebody else has an additional one. And let's self-slot into this, and then we'll see that there is uh, uh, my, some categories remain very, very empty, and we are we are non not representing a full discursive spectrum because we have been kind of insulated and, and, and incestuous within that kind of left uh, liberal. Uh, suppose if you do that, Patrick. <laughs> let's say suppose if you do that, and I think that's an interesting <laughs> remark. Do you think that diagram that will be pr produced will match this diagram? What do you think? Uh, no, I think there will be large empty regions and everybody clusters into the kind of social democratic. <laughs> it's my suspicion. No, but, but, uh, yeah, but, but I think uh, uh, what I think is, a, a, is completely different, and I'm, I have to insist on that, because the, the way you're treating politics is categories that are dealing with an actual way of dealing with politics in the real world. And yeah, I think exactly. what is important, at least in, in the understanding of this diagram, is that certain political categories can be permitted into architectural decisions. And uh, surprisingly enough, and uh, we were making laugh of, of it when we received the article and we have this, it said, oh, so their thesis basically is that somehow the practice through a style, and we were like laughing at it, could be a kind of a delineated or can be identified as political kind of or critical kind of positions. And, and that does something quite interesting because it's not dealing with social democrats, uh, leftists, right hand, whatever, but it's the use of history, for example, as a tool to, to, to engage with certain kind of political kind of stance, right? Or material processes, or the uh, conflicted categories such, such as uh, cute activism that you were referring to, where they're like conflicting and by themselves are provoking certain engagement with uh, other realms. So I, I guess that, that's the challenge, you know, if this aesthetic, almost aesthetical categories, could be corresponding to certain political stances of these actors. So um, just want to build a little bit and be a little bit contentious. So I really enjoyed when Patrick came out and said what he did about radical capitalism. I, I appreciated it straightforwardly. And the reason why I appreciated it is because it was a, there was an intentionality to it. The intentionality allows for debate, and actually, I'm pretty certain over a period of time, there will be a type of client that will phone Patrick up and say, I want to explore this future, right? So politics is not this kind of monolithic thing. We live in a world of discovery of politics.
So I would say the most interesting thing is when practices are, are discovering a new politic. That is when new architecture comes about. And this is an intentional relationship. So your intentionality in terms of how you describe it in the world also has a feedback cycle to actually attract clients with a particular discourse. So I think this neutral thing that I'm a professional, I'm quasi non, is, is kind of like, well, you're not really a professional, you're just preserving the status quo. And I think, whereas the, I think there's something quite radical in when, I know you had to retreat from that position, but, but there was something quite smart, and I, you know, we could have a more informed debate about whether that was the right model or not, but the idea that a radical market-led approach could create a new type of urban environment, and could it, and the question was, could it deliver greater equality, could it deliver greater justice, was an intentional discourse which allows for actually a new type of client to emerge in that discourse. So the architects do, through their intentional discourses, create new polit political landscape. So the question is, for me, those practices become interesting in the act of creating a new political landscape. Right? It is not about old-fashioned categories. I think it's the discovery of new politics that makes them interesting. So I don't buy, I'm a professional, so I, I can disassociate myself. Um, not, not from a, because I think the reality is we should be discovering new politics. That is when interesting architects, architecture happens. And I think that the intentionality was actually interesting. And I, I wished we'd had a more profound debate rather than just an old-fashioned critique sort of lambasting that we saw of, of Patrick's position, right? I think there was an opportunity to have a profound debate about, well, does that build a different type of urbanism? What, what are the challenges that it proposes? And thereby, we could have had an informed position from practice. So I think there is an issue, and I welcomed your intervention, and that doesn't mean I agree, but regardless, it is important for that intervention to happen. So the intentionality, I think all those interesting practices at the time that they made something created a new politic, and they discovered a new politic in relation with the client. Yeah, but don't, don't you think that if we go back to the categories that uh, Patrick says are yeah. seriously <laughs> political, I I'm not sure socially, they are. social liberals, etc., yeah. we, we I, go yeah. back to a situation where, where I, I we think, making making possible for the discipline to, yeah, to actually capture that and, and, and in a way that is the reason why I think we, those are, we are drawing a circle. Yeah, but I because think those finally are simplistic. you need to draw the circle. But I think those are simplistic categories, Patrick. I mean, like I think they 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 are. Well, I all think categories are about simplifying a whole spectrum. Yeah. But but these are the ones on the table. Maybe I forgot. Uh, something we wouldn't consider, which is some kind of traditional conservatism, although there are architects, historical architects yeah, sure. in London that are show at the RBA with, with drawings looking like 18th century pencil drawings, and their politics is equivalent to that. So we, that's what we've got. And of course there are various factions and sub-factions. You can make that as complex as you want, but what I would not find credible is that we sit here as architects uh, and, and reinvent the political spectrum. There are discourses out there which I think a, a serious architectural theorist's duty would be to relative to, to inform themselves about and position oneself about with respect to their conceptions of a progressive human trajectory because what all these discourses share and that they shouldn't be vilified in, in any direction. If I accept them as discourses which come with a premise of some kind of, uh, yeah, the collective good. In one way or another, even if you, if you push an anti-collectivism and an individualism, behind that is an argument for the collective good, for, for that coexistence and of a prosperity uh, uh, co uh, driving cooperation, not only coexistence, which is, which is the domain of the political. So I think we, we can't reinvent that. We need to just scan that and, 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 and assert ourselves in that and read this. And I think, what, and I, think yeah, I always like Alejandro, that he was one of those few where he said I was the odd one out uh, in, an, in a field of, in a kind of group of apolitical figures, but I, I noticed that you were somebody who had, had similar sources and reading similar um, um, issues. You were also immersed in the post fordism discourse, which I found was fundamental at the time, uh, to, to give at least some socioeconomic foundation to what then later became parameticism, what was that interest in complexity in, in, yeah, but in the, systems. The, 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 this is and, where I, I mean, yeah. you guys keep Going back to the political lingua, I'm, I'm, I'm trying, and I, this is what I was trying to do with the with the diagram, to bring the political thing back to, back to the discipline. So I'm yeah. I'm interested in in yeah. the moment in which the neoliberal um, free flow capital 
becomes free-flowing architecture. I'm interested in the, uh, when the populist discourse becomes a, a kind of a diagrammatic, reductivist architecture. I'm interested when uh, people start rejecting complexity in favor of or, or rejecting uh, or, or embracing uh, cuteness or embracing pastel colors uh, 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 and putting them together with a certain political position. The, the, and this is why I keep going back to the, to the circle. Whether no 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 because I mean the, I I I I I'm 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 all for the uh, mm, uh, kind of borderless discipline and engagement with the wider field. This is also what what uh, what Liam said. But but this experiment is is not about that. I mean I I I am one of the first ones who has been always interested in looking outside the, the field of the discipline, but only as a as a as a source of possible changes in the discipline. And finally, what we are doing here is to try to bring those political terms uh, back to formal, organizational, uh, architectural uh, problems. I think that the, the value of the boundary, if it's whether it's a circle or what, it might be about distinguishing a, a kind of endeavor or, or an attempt, and you know that was, and it's difficult to find the words, but it's. Um, it might be a sort of cheesy word like humanism or something like that, because I mean, if you look at just a random at someone from another category, like Yunyi in Ishigama or something, you know, and on all, um, I would see an attempt, and it's beyond style or method, is to, it, it's criticality, is a criticality against the alienation and kind of commodification of the, the world, and it's about a kind of presence of being alive, the existentialism, you know, the, the, just the, the joy, the kind of presence of material qualities of things. And, and that, that I see in th those kind of things, which you could go on a long kind of list of all those kind of human pleasures and whatever, um, I would see across that whole spectrum, which distinguishes them from a kind of, you know, a, a just a kind of less interesting set of kind of work elsewhere. So I just I'm not so sure it it uh, it really it really matters what these different kind of uh, attempts are doing. I think the distinction is the distinction from non-thinking um, compliance elsewhere, just mere performance in say other other work elsewhere. So that's that's where I see the criticality of all of those practices. Why do you, do you, I mean, here there are, there's a group of people who are talking about criticality. Why do you think criticality is that important? Uh, well, well, not, maybe not criticality in the sense of used typically in architecture. Um, I would say because um, uh, critical as in uh, proposing something uh, valid, um, more energetic, more possibility, more uh, more potential future, um, critical in that sense. So, for example, in our work showing that the state has a valid role and isn't the state isn't an abject thing, an abject kind of unperforming monster. Actually, it's a completely valid underpinning of of everything else, uh, and that the personal, you know, the personal, the, the feminist, the political in architecture is also a completely valid part of the work and by connecting all of those issues in a way that mainstream economics and politics doesn't do that, that itself you could call it critical you could call it just more interesting and more in touch with mo human life because i think most humans get that politics and human and economics includes all of those spheres and that's why they find traditional economics and traditional politics so weird and alienating and, and frustrating. But I, I would, first of all, I, I don't particularly like 
the critical, because I think the critical is always something that opposes something else, as opposed yeah, to yeah, making yeah, an affirmative yeah, statement. Yeah. So, so uh, I'm, I'm not so sure that the critical No, no, is, I, I kind of got is, worried about it. As soon as I said it, oh, I thought, I thought <laughs> the whole horror, horror yeah, of kind no, of no, what no, I got no, myself but, in but for. But you said it, but he but also it, said no. Yeah, I, don't I think it's critical, to to it. critical in relation to, to a lot of... I think, Adam, you shouldn't be shy about it, because I think the criticality that you're referring to, in a way, comes from the notion of the criticality towards a negative response, exactly. which is embedded in the project of autonomy, of Eisenman, of exactly. Hayes, and so on. That has a long tradition of creating projects of negation, right? And, and I already said in my earlier statement, projects of negation, to me, I don't find them interesting mm -hmm. because they do not make meaningful changes, mm -hmm. right? But I think there are two other ways to think about criticality, right? Uh, one, of course, is through hate. Hilde Hainer's notion of criticality and the avant-garde, right? Mm -hmm. She thinks that an architecture is critical when it's able to locate a certain group or interest that are neglected and are oppressed, and in which then architecture mobilizes its disciplinar disciplinary knowledge to make that meaningful change, right? Mm -hmm. So I think that form of criticality, in a sense, is closer towards our ability to empathize, right? outside of our comfort zone. And that's where I come back to our ability, if to be political, is to bring a certain capacity for accommodation, right? So this is where I think uh, uh, architects could be most politically operative, right? That's where, that's where I, I, I started by saying. So I wouldn't be shy in saying critical. I, I believe in being critical, right? But not in the sense of creating the position of autonomy and negative, uh, yeah, negative project. Exactly. <clears throat> forms of engagement with the world through the discipline, so the, through the practice of discipline, our discipline, our everyday tasks, uh, being connected with things on, on the, on, of the world and being discussing them as well, and uh, create forms of practicing that are like critical with the previous somehow generations, because every single generation builds its own context somehow to be referred to. And uh, forms of engagement are like uh, also inquiring reality, which is a different thing. I'm not just speaking about critical in terms of, of maybe mm -hmm. in terms of uh, the autonomy of the, of the discipline and the negation and the paternalism implied in them, but uh, I would say there are forms in this area mostly people are trying to engage differently with the discipline mm -hmm. and inquiring also reality around them. Right. I think. It, well, I would like to also introduce something, but maybe it's an old-fashioned thing. Uh, some of the practices in the, and some of the categories that you, you drew up mm -hmm. uh, were coming back to certain uh, basic architectural, purely architectural uh, issues, really into the discipline. So I'm, I'm and looking at the revisionists, neo historicists constitu constitutionalists, material fundamentalists, while others are looking, you know, outwards, you know, and, and including maybe the technocritical, which is different from the technocratic. And I think that that is also kind of interesting in, in this world, right? The ones that are really looking into, you know, the world and the ones that maybe are like uh, coming back to certain disciplinary knowledge. And that's something that uh, I, I, my opinion is not being reflected in there, but I think it's super interesting in, in, in the way many of us are, are practicing nowadays. nowadays. But I, I mean, I, I guess when I look at the work of, say, Office or something like that, and I think, they're, you know, they're, they're amazingly beautiful work, which is, has, you know, at one level a kind of strict autonomy, but that's not inward looking or backward level. It's just like this beautiful kind of openness to life and a kind of possibility of living. So I just, I, I would really be careful of those caricatures that if someone's into autonomy or whatever, it's somehow inward looking and not looking at the world. I think, I think like, the buildings of office allow this incredible kind of the world in them. That I think there are like uh, people particularly interested in looking at the discipline itself, particularly interested in, in having a revisionist uh, project, you yeah. know, about its history, about representation, about uh, material properties, about certain uh, kind of phenomenological take, about certain kind of very disciplinary in the core of the discipline itself. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that uh, this is a bad thing or a, bad, or a good one. I'm just saying that the, is the, the way they're practicing and the way they're declaring their position is based on that. I'm not saying that this is good or bad. 
you know, while others are not looking at that. And there is a kind of interesting theme as well. It's just, I'm, I'm, I'm not categorizing, I'm saying that, you know, there is a certain tendency towards that. Can I just quickly pick up on what uh, Chris was saying, maybe Adam, and introduce a distinction which might be helpful. So I, I, I've been in my writings distinguishing between some kind of a, a micro-politics of an institution one engages with, uh, which would come through, at, for instance, if you have a client, a corporate client, and you need to work with a certain corporate culture, which has been changing re in recent years, not, which is now more participatory, more open, where you break down barriers between different categories of workers, um, um, et cetera. Um, th there's been these institutional micro-changes in relationships, and they would show up in the way you lay out spaces. The, and this comes closer to the formal organizational um, um, level you've been talking about, and um, something uh, like this would, would be kind of an open bureau landschaft uh, uh, where also instead of the uh, where the meeting rooms are now is set in, into the center rather than on the top floor. There's, we've been engaging in projects like this, and that that would call the, the, the domain of the micro political. Of course, it is not tot strictly uh, separate from uh, these. If certain micro politics come to the fore, which again I think they're, they're coming from the client, but a sophisticated and attuned architect can facilitate them and tease them and recognize their progressiveness, even if it's a corporate. They mediate, of course, into, into uh, political at large, that if you, that you would presume then that these firms, they have an overall legitimacy still, and you don't castigate them from a kind of anti-capitalist standpoint, don't touch Google. Uh, so that's the way they mediate up into a, in an overall position with respect to what I call a global or macro-political stance. Um, so the, the, this, this is sometimes quite helpful, and I think that, that projects operate on the uh, micro-political level always. It comes mostly from the client, but we should be attuned to this. And there exists in a macro-political frame where they might become politicized, and where we also discuss these issues more in a broad, uh, broad kind of setting, which direction is progress lying, and that's why, for instance, ask, you should ask yourself so seriously. And we can't just say, okay, I like this. For instance, you talk about an existentialist a sensing of a space and openness, which, which seems to me to, to value individuals and individual self-directedness and experience. How does this tie in? Where could this occur? What is the institutional setting for this? And, and how, uh, how is that flourishing? What sort of conditions of individual flourishing? And there we could, by, there the discourse bifurcates. Those people who think that it is, markets actually are not standing in the way, uh, and others think that uh, we need to kind of, um, this abstract market freedom isn't enough, we need to protect true freedoms so of kind of social redistribution. And then we, then we have a macro-political debate, which we need to come towards a certain point. Uh, and I want to just ask Adam, for instance, when he's t re emphasizing a number of times that the state is something uh, very important and legitimate, and re engaging with this, and I would, as a professional, in my professional practice, not question this, otherwise, I'm not participating. But for instance, here the question then comes where's the overall vision, and are we arguing for the state sh sh accumulate more powers, uh, more regulatory powers, more? Um, 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 aspects of society being channeled through that kind of political system, or are we promoting and, and considering that this could be um, with a way to, to some extent, to use a Marxist term, by, by giving more degrees of freedom to, to individual entrepreneurship, uh, uh, responsibility, uh, the free experimentation with new uh, forms of uh, relationships, markets, forms of public engagement, which are also media and Wikipedia and, and eBay and all sorts of initiatives where you say we need the state to frame uh, market relations. We now see actually entrepreneurs framing new forms of not only markets, but publics through Facebook, <coughs> Google, through, through, through all sorts of uh, blogosphere, which is, which, is, which is the kind of publics which we're engaging with. What is our position and stance? That would be a political question, let's say, which we could start debating around. Mm -hmm. I think, well, I think it's just um, escaping from the kind of either or. 
or the kind of denigration, uh, just the wholesale denigration of the state. No, that's not talking know, about which it. Is, which what's is the, the kind of usual line, you know, do you want freedom or do you want a kind of shitty state? You know, it's like, it, it's... Um, and of course, the state is foundational and, you know, you don't, you don't get... There's, there's no free market. There's, there aren't any free markets. And there's kind of the words to use, like deregulation... There's no deregulation. It's just a shift in types of regulation. You know, there's no, there's no free market. You don't have to okay, get a free market in weapons and passports, are you? You know, it's only a matter of uh, balance and judgment between those, between those forces. No, but now you I become mean, a fundamentalist. I'm just saying, let's grant this, where we have a status quo. Which no, di direction would you t t turn the dial? But I, uh, I, yeah. think, I think there's actually a slightly Slight. different nuance I'm hearing, which is, I, don't, I agree with Adam that, in a sense, the issue isn't um, more or less. I think the state is going to evolve uh, in this new market. What you rightly say, the Google is creating a new type of public, which is still acting like a corporate. And we know that Google will have to be re. We will have to reimagine what the monopoly of Google is, how it's imagined, like we did with utilities. So we are going to reimagine the state in this new future. So I think to to make it reductive to being more or less actually destroys our capacity to imagine what these different contributions are. And I think we should just be a little bit relaxed about, well, actually, what is a collective? We know that increasingly, if you look, think of the state as a kind of a collective business model, a shared business model, which has a perpetual long-term liability, long-term interest, which is an infinite interest in, the t in time, you start to create a different type of opportunity landscape. So I think it's not about more or less, but reimagining it in the birth of new technologies and new behaviors and actively imagining that state. So, you know, like this iPhone, and I'm sure you can do this better than I can, or this phone, for example, 80% of the technology in this phone was funded by the state. DARPA in the US, 80% of an iPhone's IP intellectual property was funded by state. It wasn't funded by Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs was like the small end of a very large uh, state-driven infrastructure. So I, I think we just need to be a little relaxed about not falling into these simple polarities, which aren't real. I mean, I would say, I agree with you. Let's imagine them both. I think they're both going to get reimagined pretty radically, and they already are. And I think we just need to start to be more relaxed about those opportunities. I think the whole distinction of public-private is an old world distinction in a world which is about massive interdependency. So interdependency is changing this language of public and private, state and individual. I think we're going to start to reimagine this stuff. And I think the discovery and the reimagination of this new politic and the places of this new politics is where it's going to get really interesting for me. And I think that's just, that's what I'm hearing. Is, and I think the act of political architecture for me is about the discovery of a, of, a, of a public or human good which is as yet not commodified. So when you discover a public or human good and you in, encapsulate it, which just hasn't yet been commodified into the, land, into the financial markets, sure, sure, that's powerful architecture. I, I accept that reimagining uh, position, but we need to, I think we need to start that concretely. So. So I've been trying to reimagine, for instance, the urban development process yeah. so and, we, and, and, and look at some of the, the players, actors, and who I would, where I see the initiative and the next uh, but, but innovations the, I mean, coming from. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, th this is all very nice and <laughs> kind of uh, uh, well, well high-minded and well-meaning, but, but I keep uh, saying, coming back, to what do we do as, uh, as architects? Because you know we can keep talking about the state, we can keep, keep talking about the way the new politics are going to are going to happen, uh, and we are obviously affected by that. But in what way we operate within that that field? And I, I wanted to um, mention one word that uh, Patrick brought in, which is micropolitics. Uh, why do we need to have the kind of big uh, political statements. Why can we not start talking about the politics of that window that has a new value that is probably shit because it's single glazed and it uh, doesn't close properly or the issue. I mean, those are the really important political issues now, which is how much does this uh, building, how much energy does this building require, how much does it pollute the air? Uh, how much uh, global? I mean, th there is a there is a kind of uh, a crucial uh, set of micro politics that are directly related to the implementation of 
of architecture that we can mobilize without necessarily having to go to decide what the state is going to be. And I'm not saying that you should not think about that, but you can think about that as a private uh, uh, individual. As an architect, you need to think about other things. And as an architect, you have other tools to operate on actually global politics, which is how much insulation do you put in, in your buildings, for example, as a, as a kind of micro-political system. Absolutely, and it's much closer to, to architecture, but if, if you think things through, and if you run into barriers with your micropolitics, you will be drawn into the micropolitical kind of vistas. And and I don't. I what is the problem? I don't think this can be avoided. Operating on a micropolitical level, can, always. I don't think it can be avoided. Uh, and in the end, if it's not spelled out, it is implicit. So the Foucault was a is the greatest micropolitician, let's say, of the of of the 20th century. In, you know, one ha you know never came out with a macro political vision, but it is also, it makes him extremely vulnerable. What was he? Was he a kind of uh, anarcho-syndicalist? And if he was, um, which I think that tended to, then where was the viability of this? Uh, so I think it's not, uh, I think we can go quite a far. A lot of people, most people here operating on the micro political level. And I think that's valid. But I think somebody somewhere will have to think through and um, um, how this ties in with, with uh, into a macro political vista, vision, let's say. Because it's not, they're all not equally compatible, I would argue. They're not, sorry, what they're not? There is interdependencies between micro and macro politics. The question is growing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Because my responsibility is too big, I am the only here and, uh, yeah. so, and and too, too much I mean I'm too shy to be here but anyway I would like to say something about the how we react uh, when you invited us to do that we were very excited we said to you oh, this is great we like it and then we never answered because we didn't want to uh, be under any of those categories <laughs> Uh, the the first thing, thank you, Liam, for talking about feminist and, and, and the gender, is that I don't believe in gender. I mean, everyone that knows us is like, I am not a woman to start, so <laughs> I don't believe in categories also. We don't believe in categories. And, and it was just, I would say, interesting to see the mirror and to see our names in there with people around and these kind of things. But I think that what is really interesting is your provocation. You are provoking this conversation, and, and it's really the, the, the interesting too. This is nothing. It could be a square. It could be a square with PV in the center. Yeah, we're well, well aware. <laughs> <laughs> but, but really, it's like a, I, I cannot imagine how you can really start to have a tool to, to really do things like that. And on the other part of the, of the position. We have very good friends that are extremely radical, uh, left-handed minds, and they went to the reclaiming the streets and so on, and then they are working in cooperative uh, firms like Foster, maybe Taha Hadid. So, and they are like dressing very well and doing things that behaving every day, and then they, they are going to the reclaiming the streets. And we don't know why they are not having really this understanding of their lives when they are uh, active also in the discipline. Mm -hmm. So there is a big fracture, that is clear. And, we don't and, I, and I would add that there are like in this table, there are two ways of responding to that question. One is tending to go to the macro politics, you know, speaking about the state and so on, it's a different level of discussion. And we are, you know, the two of us more interested in, in a completely different discussion. It's how can we engage with forms of politics, of critical engagement, or whatever, throughout the discipline? That's, that's the main question of this, of this diagram. It's not about the state or the micro politism versus uh, micro ones. I mean, it's that how we architects can be active while still designing and while still practicing. Because I think that you, 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 I perfectly understand your discourse. It's totally, totally consistent with your practice. You know, on one hand, I'm having this political discussion, and on the other hand, I have my design firm. Yeah, so I can be really active in the political field, provocate, provocating, but I'm doing my job in the business hours. Okay. So I have my political position in there, and I have my business in here, and 
there are no things together because I don't want to contaminate one another, right? It's the way we, we see that. I'm not saying that it's wrong or right, huh? It's the way we saw our previous generation. And uh, I guess, I mean, uh, understanding certain practices in here, fellow people on the table as well, there is a certain other ways of engagement, you know, with the practice, which are like more somehow not detached, you know? Or, or not that separate, mm -hmm. I would say, right? And they are more engaged with this kind of design problems through, you know, everyday practice. I wonder why then, Alejandro, if you're so interested not in necessarily the positions that people are taking, but how those positions manifest themselves in forms of practice, why are your categories not more based around the mediums of practice as opposed to the positions of those practices, right? Because I'm intrigued like how many, like Patrick talks about a professional capacity versus a discursive capacity, as if those things um, are different, but I wonder how many on that board actually operate within a traditional client service industry model, right? How many on the board have actually built a significant building? Um, uh, because in order to do the, so many of the things that we're talking about, um, the dominant form of practice now isn't necessarily the one of making buildings, or at least not sitting in a room waiting for the phone to ring, hoping for a client with money to call you up and employ you, right? It's people seeking out, reimagining those models, um, operating distinctly as spatial practitioners, as architects, where the building isn't the solitary endpoint. And I think that's why Andreas Hacker chose to distribute his projects within the diagram, because he's trying to describe a fact that each project, or the mediums of each project, may operate very differently when he does a performance versus uh, an interior fit out. Those projects are politically operating in a different mechanism. Um, because that's a very different diagram, right? Where you start to talk about um, people who are on the board because of a teaching practice, whereas someone's on the board because of a, a building practice. I might be on there because of a speculative practice in some form or because of a film. Um, like, like that kind of argument seems to move closer to where you want to be, which is defining how all of these um, uh, political systems actually manifest themselves in different forms of practice as a, as a type of activism. But, but I would say, I personally, I mean, I, I think that, that that would be a very interesting analysis to do, but I am more interested in, in understanding not, not just the practices in terms of how the practice is organized, how does it acquire uh, projects, how does it relate to, to, the, to the clients or to the constituencies that it covers, uh, but what is the outcome, the spatial and material outcome of those practices? So whether they are complex or simple, whether they are uh, pastel or gunmetal, whether they are uh, what was the other? Whether there are there are the there are the they are deliberate, which means they are uh, precise about the forms they produce in respect to a certain uh, program, or on the contrary, they are uh, playful and contingent. Mm. I am interested in in the in the final uh, outcome of of this, and I think when we were doing the the. The, the chart, we were trying to target that, that problem of how different political modes <coughs> may or may not align with certain material traits, or ge geograph ge geometrical traits of the, of the, of the project. And so I, I, you guys keep going yeah, but out to the big political <laughs> narratives, and I'm trying to bring you back let's, to architecture, which let's, is a, I know it's a very conservative thing to do. I'm sorry about let's, it. Let, let's but. bring it back. Let's, let's bring it back. So the reason why I have a little bit of question about it is that, so when we did WikiHow, so when we did Open Desk, right, what is that? It's a process, yeah. Is, I mean, so, uh, so what is the architecture? It's typically, it's formal, it's, is it traditional? But you are still choosing geometry, materials, and everything that we are yeah. trying that belongs to the discipline, and that's everything we have been trained for, and we are using, exactly. we, are, the, we decide the, every single day. Uh, absolutely, but the point is that it, it, the, these categories, mm -hmm. architecture for me is not just the kind of the material <coughs> object, it's process, it's, 
so we, when we did WikiHouse, we not only did we talk about an open source housing structure, it, it, we also created the kind of code for it. We created actually the mechanism for it to be distributed. We helped 36 communities to be built around the world and growing. When we did OpenDesk, open source furniture company, that's gone global. So I, I, just, I, 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 I get it, and genuinely I respect what, what's been done. I just wonder whether there's a new, new way of looking at this problem. Um, and the other thing I just want to add is, I actually think, I mean, uh, so I, I think it's really important that we don't get obsessed by micropolitics. I think that was exactly the debate of the last, you know, last 10, 15 years. I mean, I was very, Sunan Prasad is a very good friend of mine, um, but I was very critical of this kind of micro-politicization of architecture. I think the period right now, and every time there's a cycle, I think the cycle right now is the opportunities to have big ass conversations. So when Elon Musk can talk about going to Mars, and we're talking about, well, you know, what's the politics of a plain glass window? Yes. We have a problem here, right? So, and I'm not advocating Elon Musk. I'm saying the intentionality of possibility is there. We have the intent, we have, there's a possibility to create a new discourse. There's big ass conversations of universal basic income, for example, in Finland, there's a trial going on right now. So we know there is massive opportunity for a different scale of conversation, which I think we should embrace, not shy away from, not retort to. I think that will change the nature of architecture more foundationally. And I think that's what we're seeing, is architecture changing much more structurally rather than just informatically. But if that was, true, that, that was true, you would be able to tell us right now in what way you yes. really intelligent practice, and, and I mean yeah, it. I think that yes. the wiki house is fantastic. <coughs> I think that many of the things that we are doing processually are incredible. Yeah. Uh, but has have they changed architecture? Have they produced yeah, but, a new? But, I mean, yeah, but, uh, like, do they produce more simple buildings? Do they produce so, more insulated? I mean, yeah, so, or, I mean, do, do, will, yeah, I will, will you converge into an architecture or not? Maybe we need to. I'm. I'm, I'm not. Uh, this is a question yeah. so, for for you sure. all. Do, I, do, I, I, I agree produce? that you need to think about them, right? For sure. I think it's, it's a responsibility of the generation. It's but, also an but yeah, exactly. It's an but my feeling is that Elon Musk could talk about going to Mars because he has the means to do so. So the question is do architects have the means to do what you're saying? Yeah, but I mean, like, Musk, Musk isn't, isn't talking about Mars because he has some ambition I'm using to go his there. example. He, he, yeah, he, like he, the point, but I think to, to, to build on um, um, Indy's example, the point is that he, he's setting up this set of broad ambitions because ultimately they may, that may filter down through the practice of Tesla and that may generate a, a new, more fuel-efficient system, right? Or uh, a more powerful but lighter battery, right? Like the, the vision is purely about generating a whole series of other outcomes that sit underneath it, right? And that's the history of the speculative project within architecture as well, right? Like it has no currency about cities that are going to walk around and shit out other cities. Sure. It's about destabilizing the dominant discourse around uh, housing and permanence, for instance, sure. or a model of post-war housing versus the embracing of new um, no, no. disposable and temporary yeah. material systems. No, no, right? that's not what I meant. I, I, I don't mean that we should stop thinking speculatively and thinking big. What I'm saying is that if we want to make those changes that you're describing, should we perhaps join a political party and be more, more active and more direct but you know, think, in making I, those I think, changes? In a way, I'm going to side with Patrick, which is kind of interesting. Uh, but, <laughs> <laughs> but, but in a way, the opportunity exists for, I think, this, I think architecture at, that, at a certain scale is political. Sure. De facto. Sure. And the reality is, we don't if, you're doing, if you're doing urban regeneration and you change the financial model of urban regeneration because you allow it to be crowdsourced or you put a social impact bond on it, you fundamentally change the nature of what yeah. you design because fundamentally the design is no longer about the real estate capital model, it's about a different form of outcome. So we can design, and this is the question, what are we designing? I think we are obsessed by the materiality debate. I think we design places, not matter. And I think when we design places, not matter, we can start to influence the systems that create places. Yeah. And that allows us to think about architecture in a much broader context. I, I, and I'm telling you that, from, like, we've set up social investment funds. I don't, I think we mustn't let ourselves get limited or obsessed. I think the outcome is the issue, and places are the issue. And I think we can have an opportunity to design places in a much more structural sense. But I agree with that, but I want to come back and mediate back the, the micro-political into the micro-political. 
how they tie together and 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 in terms of these imaginings you want to you want to promote so i look at for instance the example of the collective and the whole concept of shared living and how it needed to loop to loophole to kind of uh, burst forth how it creates an enormous amount of uh, resonance and and becomes a success model and it changes of course the micropolitics of a community living together uh, with a much more, more shared and open and um, far less degrees of privacy, much, much smaller individual uh, private uh, slots in this. And then in the kind of theoretical discourse as yeah, radicalized with someone like PV taking this on and radicalizing without any residue of, of, of a private place. And this does challenge macropolitics on a number of ways because the people would stand up and say, hey, this is self-exploitation, that is a co coquetary, you can't allow them to live on 10 square meter, or you say this is about uh, curating an exclusivity, uh, this is, this is, you know, this is become this kind of uh, professional uh, tech bubble people who shield themselves from others, and then suddenly this, this gets politically attacked, and you get political movement against this, and I think that's highly problematic, and we have to discuss about <clears throat> the possibilities of this, of such spaces of, of self-curation to allow to have maybe, and my argument would be, for the first time the chance that there is really a truly living community. Because, let's face it, 99% of the uh, times where you live uh, jungle together, jumble together in an arbitrary residential complex, you, you never speak with any of your neighbors, and the more the diverse is, the less you actually communicate, the more you, you, you build up friction, perhaps. But there's an ideology and the, and the master political narrative, macro political narrative, which, which, which wants to kill these, these kind of projects. And, and therefore, I think, um, and, and it's very much, uh, um, uh, of course, that formal organizational architectural uh, uh, rethinking of typologies. Which, 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 is, which is imbued with the micropolitics, which signals out and becomes a political issue out in, in macro. The same with all the, with the attack against all the so-called gig economies and, yeah, and, and Uber and all the, and, and Airbnb. These become political issues very, very quickly. The, and they're also feedback on a micropolitical but, but they're not, they're So not, this is the way we have to discuss yeah. and take a stance macropolitically on this. I, I don't think it's about a stance, it's about comprehension. So the collective or whether Airbnb or all of these things these are actually rental economies. And the question is, in a, in a market where actually, in a, in a society where real estate is increasingly the only place for investment for many citizens, actually is increasing rented, uh, rented environments, is that a good thing? Not a good thing. Is, 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 is it a good thing? Is it a good thing? It's a question. Yeah, I believe so. No, no. Whereas I think actually without access to landscape, without access to be able to buy, you actually reduce increased vulnerability and inequality. So I would argue that actually not having access, so actually the monopolization of these, of real estate, actually becomes a fundamental problem. Now, I'm not saying whether, we don't have to argue whether it's right or wrong. I think the interesting thing is, are we being critical about it? Are we having the debate? Because foundationally, our responsibility as a profession, right? We are not market or actors. Our responsibility is a profession, and our responsibility is to the public good. So the issue is not whether I'm right or Patrick is right, but we have to be able to debate whether what we are talking about is for the public good and how it advances the public good. That is our responsibility as a profession, and that's the interesting thing. So the, for me, what's fascinating is you're creating the landscape for the discursive capacity. I don't, you know, we can have that challenge of what is public good now, what is the risk, and what's the implication, and the issue for me is be, we are not, we have not historically had that debate in the profession. We've been blind to that debate and we had bullshit debates. It's like house prices increasing. Most of your house prices increase. Do you know why they increase? It's nothing to do with the house. It's because you have monopolistic access to common goods, right? So the house itself is a depreciating asset. The land is near worthless. The only thing that's worth money is the access to common goods. And so if your house price increases, it's because common goods have inflated and you have access rights. So even all the language of how we understand value is outdated. And I think the more we become sophisticated on our language around this stuff, the more critical we can become about how we talk about value and respond to our responsibility of public good, which is what I am interested in, is the discovery of new public goods or new goods that have yet not been fixated on. <laughs> who's, um, who's the diagram for? Alejandro. 
I think it's, 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 uh, it's for the architects to, to understand whether their practice is relevant politically any longer. So if I follow Patrick and Indy's statement, and maybe Adam's statement, uh, maybe it's not relevant anymore. No, the architecture. <laughs> the, 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 the diagram, the diagram is, is potentially or is ideally or hopefully an instrument to to to, to see whether there is a, a, a possible architecture that will engage in, oh, it is incredibly in the regimes relevant. of power. It is incredibly relevant because you know some, something like the collective you, you let it fly you allow architects to reimagine ways of living on uh, urban structures together with an entrepreneur like this and then the question for me the meta question is I want to ask Indy now I agree we can have a debate about it you can have your worries about it what you see the problems and now for me the next question comes in if you if you detect problems are you willing or calling for the state to step in to, to back your worries and stop this? Or are we having a different understanding of a political discourse, my understanding of the political discourse, that we debate these tendencies, that we promote, criticize, and, 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 and maybe boycott, but that we don't call for the state to stop, that, we, that, that you have the right with your political discourse and your proselytizing to notch forward or to, to, to stunt, and I'm trying to kind of uh, maybe notch forward and let flourish. And I have a problem with the, with, with the political date at the moment, where, where the, the big premise is, um, we all have to hold hand and we, we, where everything is an issue, a tendency, a phenomenon, something which we see. We see victims and we call for the state to stop. And I find that level of stagnation which we're confronting and, and, and freezes into status quo the problem. And that's one of the reasons why I could kind of turn libertarian. So, so I'm going to respond. I'll take that yeah. on. Um, so I, I, the reason why I think architecture is different from everything else is that the building outlasts the economic activity that designed it which means it becomes a product which has long-term impact on public goods. So I don't, think it's, it, I don't think it exists like a piece of this, which is that I can produce it, I can, even then, if Liam went, gave the full explanation of the supply chain and the impacts of this, we'd have a different conversation. But the reality is architecture does not exist in isolation and exists outlasts the economic model that, activity, uh, that, outlasts, uh, that developed it. So I don't think it, it, is, it, it is a legitimate to be able to just say, we should just allow everyone to do what they want, because actually that would actually allow for massive externalities, which are then carried by third parties. The externalities of people who can't afford to live in London, the externalities of, and these are not, as, you, you know, as Adam rightly said, there is no such thing as a perfect market, this is bullshit. And actually the reality is, there's a whole lot of constraints that bias certain things. So I think if we exist as no perfect market and there's no perfect state, then we're talking about negotiation. And democracy for me is about the negotiation of market, which is fundamentally a decision-making architecture, to the state, which is actually another form of decision-making architecture, to professionalism, which is another form of decision-making architecture. And at the confluence of this stuff, actually something interesting emerges, rather than actually saying it's one or the other. So I think we can... No, have no we've been in the same cycle. Let's say it's not one or the other. But at, if you reflect on the state of the way the system operates across London at the moment, would you call for more or less collectively driven, politically driven into, uh, regulation? Do you know what I would call for? Yeah. I would call for architects to be responsible for the public good, and I would actually get rid of plan planning. Great. So I would say architects should be accountable. <laughs> no, no, but, but it, this is important, right? I would make architects accountable for the public good legally. Right? So you are responsible. If there's, if there's 20 years on, your building causes issues, that's your shit. Right? At the same time, I would get rid of planning because I think you can actually decentralize public good creation through actually creating a new model. So I think there's lots of really interesting ways of starting to deal with this, but it would mean that architects are no longer consultants, but actually responsible for the public good and have to create a new architecture of accountability. So I think the, these frames are being reimagined right now. And I think we should just be a little relaxed about reimagining them and how public good could be. But you, you said but I will be worried if you, <laughs> if, but if public good is defined by you alone. <laughs> <laughs> That's the point of public good. It's not defined by me. So if you but look, you just said no, no, no. The, the architect, no. you know, you just no, said it. In a distributed no. way, not no, 
the the one fit the no, one fit it, all. Like that. So like as an architect, right? So how am I judged professionally? I'm judged professionally by my ability to have a discourse with my peers. It's like a doctor, right? So there's no truth. What you end up with is effectively is a discursive reality. And I think that's really much more interesting. So actually, your ability to have discursive, discursive justification, it, there's no centralized idea of public good. It is about the discovery and the ability to justify and discursively hold that public good is your credibility. And I think that's interesting. No, I think you, no, I, I think you have to be yeah, helped. I think, I think it's certainly interesting. I haven't heard by the public. No, I, I think, I worry, you know, I worry if, if, if the architect is exalted to that position. It's all exhaustion. Uh, well, I think we're worrying all too much, and we should be more less risk averse. But should you, we open to the uh, yeah. to the floor? Now, you, yes. Uh, uh, let me just mention one thing because I, I think that Indy just said something that was quite uh, quite interesting to me, which is yeah. architecture outlasts the systems that that produced it. So your wonderful kind of uh, wiki house process, etc., <laughs> etc., et ends up in an object that lasts forever and is there. And I, I think that the, the traditional values of material and architecture and, and so on, uh, as we have known it, maybe take account of that duration. I, I remember a conference that you were there when, when Saskia Sassen said in Seoul, yeah. she said, cities have outlasted every single political system. Exactly. Okay? And that is very interesting. Capitalism. Cities are older than capitalism. Cities are, are, are older than, than communism, and therefore, does this um, stability value that architecture forms through whatever process, political or not, still stand up, or, or we are dissolving into, into macro politics or large political narratives and processes? That's basically what, what, what I am. Yeah. Um, I mean, what do you think? You, you, you would, you are a kind of neo-historicist. <laughs> <laughs> no, maybe I think we should open up to, okay. to, yeah. to, to, to uh, the audience. Yeah, I think we're talking too much. <laughs> Shall I begin? Um, first of all, what about all the abandoned cities all over the world? Um, what depressed me was the lack of materiality. We're in a phase where we now have seen our globe. We know we are in the Anthropocene age with our impact. And simultaneously, we are more virtual because of the internet. We can deal with complexity in a way that we couldn't before. And these things both create our new politics. You know, I mean, I agree with everything you said apart from about planning, in that I think that, you know, the failure of strategy has destroyed this city over the last 10 years. That's it. Do you, do you answer? <laughs> <laughs> More questions, comments? Yeah. Well, I have a couple of... That's fine. Um, so first of all, thank you for all the comments. And um, as a student and what we're learning in architecture school, um, I've, I've, when we're talking about politics, what I've heard um, across, it's um, some of the comments were politically driven, political, politically inspired, politically aware. Because are we politically active? or are we aware of what's happening politically in the world? So my question is, as students of architecture and what we're entering into the architect of the profession, what would be our responsibility, and more importantly, what would be the responsibility of the universities and our professors? Is it something that we take on, on our own, or is it something that we should be um, directed towards? or a little bit um, of guidance, so. <laughs> Marco? Well, yes, uh, very should interesting. It, should it, shouldn't someone answer? Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. let's collect, <laughs> let's collect. Uh, you mean, do we, no, because I, I, I think that what you are saying is, is uh, central to, to the purpose of the, of the diagram. If in the School of Architecture, you are not exposed or you are not taught to, to a discipline that is relevant to engage with, uh, with, uh, with politics, or if, say, the practices of architecture are decentralized and they are down to your 
individual responsibilities, then maybe schools of architecture are, are not important any longer. That's what the diagram is trying to do. I would, I would say it's about cultivating an integrity. And I think, you know, when I remember you're talking about your work and engagement and you felt that, you know, it was sufficient for the practice to just engage and, and it didn't need to have a kind of macro-political stance. I, I would say that's, that's totally valid, but actually it is the seeds of a... It's the possibility of a wider new politics. And that, that, that integrity is the basis of... Um, actually, a new, a new and more valid politics. It, it, uh, maybe I've misunderstood you. I think we have the responsibility to teach. You know, somehow the ones that are, that we are related with the academia. Somehow, we have the responsibility to teach you. You know that there's there are forms of engagement through architecture, and that's it. It's for me that our responsibility. I wouldn't say that it's not. Uh, having discourses or personal discourses uh, towards macro politics. I'm saying that it's possible a, a re-engagement of the practice of architecture, even in the more like a conventional ways. So designing buildings for human purposes that are like, uh, you know, that are still having a kind of, uh, or led by someone that is deciding certain things that are not weak here, open to, you know, individual processes that I think is another valid thing. Uh, there is a possibility of re-engagement architectural decisions with politics. And they're like, uh, w what I see, and I think it's super interesting in the diagram in the different position, is that there are different forms of doing that. And our, I mean, in my responsibility at least, is teaching the students that there are different, maybe from our perspective, forms of re-engagement with the world, making, I would say, and with politics, you know, somehow. But different from discourses. It's a throughout real practice, everyday practice, I would say, right? Representation or re-engagement re with certain things in the world without necessarily coming into big discourses. It's through actual everyday practices. And I, I totally agree with that, but I think it's being potentially too reticent and too shy about actually that type of work being the basis of a new, a new valid politics for the 21st century. That rather than saying, oh, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not going to do discourse, big discourse. But actually, that is a, that is a totally valid discourse. I'm, I'm totally, you know, I totally agree. I mean, I'm, I'm not against, uh, you know, the discourses that are having, like, uh, led or have been expressed in the t on the table. I'm just saying that there is a possibility for everyday architecture and everyday architectural decisions to be re-engaged, mm -hmm. you know, to be really, and having f different forms of engagement that are dealing with discourses or bigger discourses that can permeate architectural practices. I'm just saying that thing, right? Mm -hmm. Which is a, it's a complicated thing, I know. It is a complicated thing, but still, you can see in the diagram different people that are like through the relation with the client, through the relation with the user, through the decentralization of the practice, through, you know, the reintroduction of history, some people, through the uh, interest in the discipline, others, a critical take on, on technology are cultivating these different forms of, of engagement with the world throughout the discipline, I would say, through the special practices. And I think responding to your question is, is something that we need to express, you know, somehow. I mean, instead, that I think are, are completely valid. I, I, I'm not saying that it should be denied, because it belongs to, the, to, to how we are participating in our world and our forms of engagement with the bigger discourses and with our society. I'm just saying that there is, you know, in our opinion, a possibility of bigger and smaller, you know, kind of architectural decisions to be re-engaged. Mm -hmm. Marco? Yes, a couple of words. Okay, a couple of, just wanted to try and contribute to him, maybe improve and evolve the diagram. I have a few problems with the categories. And I think probably the key is there. Uh, I make an example. I think, uh, I think I know why you're doing it. I know your interests. Austerity chic, for instance, let's start from that one. I think that describes the outcome of the process of architecture or what the Architecture Zero Zero is trying to do or Assembly is trying to do. Actually, I think politically, probably, I would say more appropriate the subversive in the sense of subverting the, the system of procurement because what they do is fundamentally deploying different 
um, method of procuring the architectural project, uh, then whether at the end it's got the sandbag look uh, or the pitch roof uh, is a result of that. Uh, it might have some relevance. So I think probably separating the look, or say the perception of the production from the, actually the political action tr through the process of architecture might be a more precise way or powerful way of, in my opinion, to to uh, categorize that. To separate what, sorry? Uh, the, the, the look or the perception of the production at the end. You know? For instance, the category that you use also is cute. Yeah. That's no political in the sense of the article. It's actually how it looks at the end is cute. Yeah. But actually, as you were saying before, the discussion that evolved was about the process. And actually, I don't know, maybe I misunderstand your position, but uh, I also believe that uh, everything we do as architect is political throughout the process, every decision that we make. So in a sense, uh, uh, it's separating the way the production looks at the end from what is the political action through the process. But, but I think there is an important issue for phantom practices in there, in where there is a... a I, may, I, may, I can make an example also, Patrick. Uh, the aquatic center happened to be my local swimming pool now. <laughs> and uh, male and female, the changing room is not separated. And that is highly political decision, I think. No? And actually, it affects the experience of a family using the building. Yeah, because if you separate mother and father, yeah, that experience in the changing room is not possible. If, am I, does it make sense what I... Especially yes. explosive politics and uh, image politics, right? These are all different types of politics, and you could structure it in that way, which it, is, I think, where it would... Yes, it, it, yeah. it, it does make sense to me, but I, I'm not sure whether... I, mean, I'm, I'm, I, I believe that in the School of Architecture we should be talking about procurement routes and uh, engagement with clients, and that has, has been traditionally part of the curriculum of, uh, of uh, architecture schools, but somehow we've never managed to get these things into the studio. Yeah, because... I, I so how do you teach? I, I mean, mean, all these no, engagement... I mean, all is, if, I mean, really trying to... Uh, because I think uh, what, what you're saying is basically there are no forms of expression in architecture. I'm, I'm, I know that I'm stepping in a, a kind of difficult realm, right? <laughs> and there are not... The decisions that we are doing on an everyday basis while designing, not also other forms of engagement that are valid, right? I'm starting, I'm starting to discuss... A certain connections of politics with maybe forms of expression, right? Throughout architecture. They are not, they are innocent, they are not having any consequence, they are having, and I truly believe that there is a kind of, also there is something under discussion for this, for a certain generation, certain practices, that there is an aesthetical problem as well to be discussed politically. And I think that that is something for me quite interesting in that thing. There are different ways including the design problem, so if it is having a pitch roof or not, it is green or black, or it's pink, uh, having a spikes, or having certain, you know? Uh, no, but I, I think, think it's very important to, to, to mediate or see the correlation between forms of engagement, procurement processes, the political underpinnings, and the political process which leads to the built environment at a certain historical era, and the formal organizational uh, character and expression of this, and in these tie together, we need to see that, and we need to uh, uh, so they, they remain separate. And if if they would be totally disarticulate, then we have a real problem. Um, so, for instance, this whole idea of a collage city, and that you can imagine something like this, is of course something which cannot come out of the central government uh, rollout. Uh, central plan, not only planning, but, but, but designing and delivering a whole city like Brasilia, or the new towns. So Kuala City is something which is, which is inherently linked to a liberalization of the development process. Right? It's something which then emerged in the 80s in the Docklands. That's Kuala, Kuala City for real. But, in, in it, but it also represents at that point a new dynamism, a new kind of prosperity potential. Uh, however, we, I was not a pro Thatcher, right? but looking back, what you can see what happened, that kind of dr dreary and, 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 and semi-dead London of, of the 70s with three days of, of um, uh, electricity and people had been moving out to the suburbs, to the Milton Keynes, of, of, etc. Now, and now look back at London, what, what, what it has become, and, that's, and it has become that raw thing which nobody could have planned. 
uh, even though planners are still hanging on. So, but this linking is very, very important to see. And for me, this investment and interest and complexity and multiple affiliation is all about having sites teasing out and finding and evolving their synergy networks through, through bottom-up trial and error, investment, profit, loss, and restart process, which is going to be very heterogeneous, very, very, but it's also vital. We've been kind of celebrating the chaos of Tokyo as, and, and the kind of, and, and learning from Las Vegas, all these, which, you, which Alejandro rehearsed, that's where you see the coincidence or strong connection between forms of engagement, uh, which become politicized, and, and results and outcomes which have effectiveness, which have pros and cons, losers and winners to some extent, but the question then is what's the overall net benefit um, uh, accounting of such processes? And are we turning the dial back or are we, are we accelerating? Looking at process and result, and be living in these results, are we cherishing them or do we want to go back to Milton Keynes? And they stay <laughs> there for a long time. <laughs> well, that's another point, yes. I think there's a problem of kind of equating you know, the Smithsons to Hyatt, you know, of, of kind of making those kind of big historical kind of putting together. Because, you know, yeah, there's a kind of liberal tendency in the Smithsons, but it's nothing to do with a neoliberal kind of right wing. It's more to do with a kind of human humanist kind of, um, libert kind of libertarianism. You know, and I think just... Uh, well, it's more like Jane Jacobs and maybe Colin Rowe. <laughs> I mean, that, that, that was an attempt to, to address a number, a number of uh, uh, theories and, and uh, practices yeah. that practice the non-planned. And, and I am actually against the non-planned. So it's yeah. not that I, I am particularly... I mean, Patrick, for example, <laughs> would say that, uh, that uh, planning should disappear, that everybody should, you know, do their thing and produce a... But I'm, saying, I, 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 but I'm I looking for that. a much more a new set of complex variegated orders, so I'm also critical of the, of the contemporary results to some extent. I wouldn't want to exchange it against Brasilia. So I take it as a piece of progress, but I'm also critical of it. Mm -hmm. But my criticism doesn't direct itself so much against the underlying politics. I should rather have more of it. But my criticism directs it itself at the discipline. And that's what we should, first of all, be critical of. And that's where we innovative and sharply critical. While we position ourselves into critical spectrum, which comes out of a political discourse, I don't think we should reinvent this. But my criticism of the discipline is that it actually allows itself to be fragmented into pluralism of, 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 of many styles, a kind of withdrawal into individual hobby horse approaches, and not challenging each other and saying, what's the direction for the discipline to make an impact? So I'm calling for a kind of meta discourse of position of let's, let's converge, let's thrash it out, where's the direction? And my, I have also a position on the table that put, uh, the, 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 the direction is hedge, but hedge you money of very much like a <laughs> You know what my position is, but, but where's the counter position? I never get the counter position, I always get the meta thing, well, no, no, we can't have that. We all have, a, we, we, we're going to have a thousand flowers blooming in terms of direction and ideology. More questions. More questions. Okay. Daniel. Everybody who asks, uh, we know. <laughs> Interested in uh, the question actually Liam asked, uh, who is this chart for? It, it seems like uh, the, um, you know, it's a very sort of uh, modernist uh, sort of view, you know, through a lens of, uh, you know, stylistic approaches. Uh, I guess, you know, you're almost trying to answer the question. Oh, before you've actually asked the question, uh, just the, as an approach, um, you know. So, it, I think it is a pluralist approach uh, that you know. That's why the architects are struggling to find a position here because very often it is a multifaceted approach. And I would say maybe it's less about sort of uh, micro and macro politics because there's always a political impact that, or social impact that any project has, architectural or beyond. Um, it, it's more of a bottom-up as, a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as opposed to a top-down sort of, you know, which is maybe last century uh, uh, view of what the approach should be to architecture. 
I, I'm just putting it as a provocation, as a you know, to uh, as a, dis a discussion point. Do you want to say something? He was he was talking. so much uh, about the single glaze pane of glass but you know it's about responding to real big problems yeah, I mean, the, the, this is this is why you know before somebody mentioned the anthropocene I, I think that one of the the progressive arrows that we can we can quite confidently claim today architects particularly is that these kind of decisions are important not not just for the for the local council politics or the local community they are in, important uh, on a kind of earth scale and this is where uh, i think that some of some of these concerns that that have to do with uh, with the micro politics uh, may may become more relevant than any other um, scope that architects have used in the in the discipline before i mean like like the politics of uh, let's say that the, the traditional forms of uh, analyzing a, a plan in architecture is uh, whether it was symmetrical or it was central or it was the panopticon and there was some sort of relationship of Surveillance or or dominance uh, is sectional. Is is uh, so what? what uh, how do the different uh, people become located in in the space of the of the building? And I think that most of these political instruments that architects used to, um, or, or, or most most of these instruments that where architects claimed a certain uh, politics like. Asymmetrical buildings are good, are democratic. Symmetrical buildings are fascists, etc. I mean, not so so long ago, uh, Hermann Herzberger was saying that horizontal buildings, uh, horizontal windows are democratic, and vertical windows are fascists. That there have been many of. Uh, I am very interested in in, in this kind of uh, of statements, but maybe uh, maybe. In order to be effective politically today, we need to actually look at the U value of the of the window. So the kind of compositions of the plan and the section as representations of society are no longer anywhere as important and as as um, what do we do with air pollution? Uh, what do we do with the drainage of the water of a building? Uh, what, what do we do with that? things that are actually historically part of the discipline of architecture? How do we manage air? How do we manage water? How do we manage energy? How do we manage biomass in cities? No, but Alejandro, this is all engineering issues. I think you were closer, <laughs> which have nothing to do. It's true. I think you're much closer to the, to the core of the argument when in your article on the politics of the envelope where you looked at different and you know basic proportions a building could take right and you could have a pin uh, a, a needle tower or you can have a slab where, where everything remains separate and segmented or you have this kind of big fat volume which Rem was talking about in terms of bigness and the regimes of complexity which become possible where you can hollow out where you can have adjacencies in all directions and these are the, the, the kind of things which matter which have I think um, agency in a sense of a, a, which are congenial to the requirements and potentials of what I call the post forest network society, where we have this kind of urban convergence. And for me, parametrism is tying in with these kind of things, the way Collage City was tying in with this. And for me, parametrism is the next things, where something like <laughs> Yokohama Terminal or it, 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 
these kind of spaces, the spaces of continuity differentiation, which is neither a vast, empty uh, flat plate, nor is it kind of dissected and hierarchized, but it's some kind of continuous variation where, 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 where you can have, uh, which for me became the model idea, rather of kind of like a bureau landschaft, openness, where you have gradients, overlap, interpenetration, networking of one space and another, embedding and diffusing, losing the object quality, this kind of concept of a field texture-like, a system. These speak to me, these have a lot of micropolitics yeah. at hands, and they have a lot of uh, socioeconomic agency, ties into the post fordism discourse. That's where we add, I think, in, in tying together. And right. that, at a, some stage, there is in there some of the horizontal window versus the, versus the vertical window, but, but that's a caricature. But, but it, uh, that can be detailed on the level of the way I just indicated, these kind of micropolitical I, I, I uh, potentials. I think the worry is that we're trying to segment it again. So we're trying to say it's plan or it's materiality or it's, and I think actually we have to see architecture as a knot, a system knot, right? Its qualities are actually everything. So Liam's fantastic work about mapping the kind of system flows around the world of this is as much politics of me writing an NBS specification is, pop, is well, a blitz. No, you may not think it, it is. is. <laughs> That's a difference, right? But, but you may not think it is, but I think. Neither of you values. No, but I, I don't. I, what I'm trying to get to is politics is as much about the impact of what materials I choose and what impact it has on other people's lives. And that is a relationship. Spatially, I also agree with you, there is a spatial politics. So, is, so co working or, shall we say, open plan offices. What, what are they? They're all about maximizing utilization. They're all about optimizing utilization where architecture is an overhead, right? It's not about architecture as a performative, something that releases human capacity. It is all the Maybe, maybe, that's a, that's a conjecture. So I would say, again, we can start to think about what is the politics of space? What is the politics of the knot? What is the politics of the dark matter that sits behind it? I don't think we should, and this is why I, so if you're saying the future is parametric, I'm saying the future is systems, seeing architecture as a system, as a knot in systems, and we design that system. And that is politics in all its dimensions, and that is where we're active on. But don't you think that uh, maybe the, the, this idea that you have of a kind of con continuously changing, which we were all very interested in, could, could, we could be accused also of being fascist with a computer? Like, like we now, before, in, in, in Foucault's uh, time or whenever the Panoptin, in, uh, the Panoptin was, was, was made, we could only draw with a, with a compass, but now we can draw with more sophisticated tools and plan more effectively these gradations, and therefore these gradations are well, not by no means a, 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 a kind of collage or organic uh, emergence, but on the contrary, the outcome of a more powerful tool to organize space. They, they are, but of course we have evolved since and much more layered, multi-system, interpenetrating and, and resonating subsystems, system all to, in systems, but what, what the, for instance, that, that notion of a gradient or the complexity we, we, which started to evolve through deconstructism into folding into parametricism, I think is very much strongly aligned, and that's the same I would argue with the Bureau Landschaft, to a society with more degrees of freedom, more self-directedness, rather than being slotted into some kind of uh, assembly line. Um, much more uh, the kind of society we all love and share and, and want to be part of. Uh, a free association, reassociation continues, uh, reassembly, regathering, redistributing, in, in, in continuous lifelong learning. Where a lot of these distinctions are dichotomies between leisure and work break down between between stages of life, like like education and, and, and delivery of towards the education, this is permanent lifelong learning, the kind of reinvention of ourselves, which is things which are maybe symbolized to a figure like Madonna, <laughs> on on a personal level, this kind of patchwork life, patchwork um, 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 existence, all of these tendencies, which in the end we all have to recognize, these kind of. Uh, uh, a new form of sociality, subjectivity, delivering a new level of prosperity in the world. They are in the category of productivity enhancing and, and new levels of productivity made available is also to be reflected. And I think that's what we have to tie in with our 
decisions where we invest into some kind of neo-rationalist, neo-minimalist stance, which I think is bankrupt intellectually and, and can't be argued, or are we, you know, continuing a project which we all understood intuitively and intellectually had a lot of lot of things going for it, so much going for it, as you remember, a whole generation within a year or two of publication of certain texts on certain seminal projects and the introduction of certain tools were on this project. There was a moment of incredible uh, excitement and galvanization and energizing of a whole generation, uh, or several generations. And that was, that was compelling us, so it is, remains compelling that there have been setbacks and problems in the last few years due to the financial meltdown, etc. Didn't never never dissuaded me. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I just think I, I, just to build on what Indy was saying that 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 is a kind of a spatial politic. But I, I think it's too easy to dismiss a kind of systems thinking as a form of engineering. Maybe the systems are the wrong word. And maybe just if we if we describe it as a kind of site or a new kind of site then maybe it becomes, um, we can reclaim it back within the domain of architecture, where we think about site not just as a series or system of a direct adjacencies. Um, I put my project here, and it responds to the immediacies of the conditions around it. But if site is a network where the material choices we make reverberate across multiple conditions of those sites, um, uh, and the building casts shadows not just on the building opposite, but it casts shadows across the planet, and then the architecture is about the designing of those shadows at all scales. Um, uh, it's overreach. Overreach? <laughs> but, 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 the, but, but the mechanisms of the architecture have consequences at those scales whether you like them or not, right? So the capacity to actually start to design sure. those systems is... Um, not just something you might choose to do, but a responsibility. And if maybe. I'm not saying that there's a non architect. Just just two things. There's a non architect and probably a different species of dinosaur, because I'm not an architect. <laughs> but I first want to say something about the diagram, which I hadn't really understood in detail till today. I think... But you had what, seen it. I had seen it. Well, and I read the essay, but I haven't fully understood it. What, what I think is interesting about it is that um, in many of the dis discussions and discourses we've all been involved in, I would say it is very important to recognize this is fantastic of you to bring it to a discussion again. I really do admire that, and I think that somehow if it gets spread around even more, I know you've been doing the world tour on this, just like take that. But in, in that sense, if we can get it out to the public a bit more, not only in the shape it's in, but in the shape of what you want to achieve with it. For example, if you reverse what Efren and, 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 and Chris said, you know, Chris talked about the very dense sector and Efren about the desert. I think you should reverse those two. So the technocratic, which is technology and the, ruled by people like us at the moment, the world. And we are politicians more than the politicians, as in engineers. If you reverse that, you as architects would re-achieve one of the things that I think you need to be doing, which is getting more projects. <laughs> Second thing, um, relating to that, I, I think you should. And I think it is probably a misunderstanding that, tech, that n most of these people don't belong to technology. Actually, all of them do in some way or the other. What's missing is how they turn that into design. And that's the second part. So listening to all of you and having worked with some of you, I, I as a client would want to employ all of you for the simple reason that you can design. And I get a lot of pleasure out of aesthetics, which none of you have talked about. So using the technology and aesthetics. That's not true. I, this is what all we are, we are interested in. But I know you are, but you never say it. So if you readdress this and put it back out in the... Most politicians are dumb. They want sound bites. You're just thin slicing this so much that you will lose all the politicians. Just get it, resectorize it and do what they do. Bring it back to sound bites and then issue it out there to the mayor. 
That's what I would do as a group of people, as, as a discipline, so that the big A of architecture reappears and your thin slicing is something we all keep secret because that's more interesting to the rest of us. That's what I would say. <laughs> That was more of a statement, right? <laughs> <laughs> what is the advice? <laughs> yeah. There is a question there. Hi. Um, so I am not at all from this world. I am a young political science student, more on that side. And I think it's really interesting that you were talking about this coming to the public. and. Um, I'm just wondering why, in a discussion between architecture and politics, we're not talking about you know, power representation, what is the role of an architect, and what's the responsibility of an architect in dealing with also the real pressing contemporary politi uh, political issues, for example, migrant crises, things like that, where housing is an actual you know, reality and, and a need. And how can something like this really speak to the public if it's so, yeah. so internally kind of, I mean, a panel of architects can't discuss it really in a, in a calm way. So how's anybody meant to enter this and understand it? Um, and what's it meant to say? I mean, honestly. But that's the thing. Like, you're, you're not making it for the public. It's not, not exactly. It's not meant for the public. But no, no. We send it to the economy. We send it to the economy. That's a political statement in itself if it's not for the public. That's a political statement in itself. No, but we send it outside the... Right? We send it to the economies and financial times as well, eh? but they are not interested in it because probably it's too disciplinary and maybe that's one of our mistakes. No. And that's why also when Alejandro was saying he was interested in populism and how this is transmitted to the general public, maybe this is a failure somehow, but, but I, it's I, an attempt. I think you make a really valid point here that I think, I, I think this is a kind of echo chamber, <laughs> and an echo chamber which is historic as well. And I think the issue is absolutely right. We are not of relevance to the FT, they wouldn't pick this up because this is bullshit for them, right? They've got, they're talking about real issues on the ground which are actually material. People's lives are on the line. And I think, in terms, and this is, my, this is my big problem, right? So if you look at the RIBA website, we have pictures of nice buildings, quote unquote nice, right? We don't talk about actually social or environmental justice uh, built environmental justice on actually the architectural profession. So unless we become actually relevant to the public issues, I think we're a marginal discourse. I don't think this is about aesthetics. I think the aesthetics is an emergent property of discovering public good. It is not the thing that we do, it is the thing that we leave behind because it is, we've discovered a public value which is not yet commodified. I think we have to address the material political issues. And I think unless we're there, we are non-relevant. And I think that's a fair point. But, but I have a problem with this uh, slightly. So. We need to also, I accept that we are in an echo chamber to some extent, but for other reasons, and, and we need to defend also an internal expert discourse where architects reflect upon how their various choices and of, of forms of practice, of formal and organizational repertoires, articular repertoires, uh, uh, tie in and tie back with uh, uh, s certain micro-political and then micro-political agendas and, 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 and choices and how this aligns under societal progress. And this discourse would not be part of, would, would not be uh, for, for the general public. Uh, but then there is mediation, which is, I think there's architectural critics writing for mass uh, uh, media organs, which mediate out and there's going to be an information loss and there's going to be a simplification there. But we need to have a more an internal discourse, which I defend. And, and I think that we have to resist the temptation to follow this call of you have to take a stance on, on Im immigration issues. So you earlier talked about certain uh, sp social injustice problems at, this, at, 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 at certain parts of, of the outskirts of London. Uh, I think we got to, that can't blast out and, 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 and criticizes arcane. That happened at the Biennales. I'm very critical of the Biennales because they've took, took over. They've buckled under this pressure and turned all the pavilions and all the show into some kind of 
uh, um, I think, easy statements about recognizing issues, but not showing work of the last two years and how architects really, what they're working on. So, so I have to resist that pressure of being relevant to the public in that, in that, in that direct fashion uh, without the mediation of an internal ex expert discourse, which, but, but which but we're maybe, starting to have. Yeah. But maybe uh, we, we are talking about the generation. No, but I have, a, I have a question about that. I mean, as architects, then, if you're looking at space, and how space affects daily lives also, right? Um, why sure. does it have to be just generalized, uh, somehow a, a question of you know, addressing an issue that's contemporary and contentious, whatever? Why can't it be about how actual architectural change is design, aesthetics, how that's actually affecting lives? Like you're saying, architects in the last two years, why can't that well, be uh, relevant that, to a discussion between politics it, and architecture? It, well, I have the following issue. It, Maybe what helps is a comparison with medicine, for instance. Um, architecture discourse in an institution like the AA, which is an elite avant-gardist space special school, and there's a few others, where we, where we think about <coughs> how the discipline progresses on the frontier of innovation. Um, and, and for me, on the frontier of innovation, it's about issues like what's the next stage of the post for the city in the most advanced arenas on the, in the what's what's the most high value high powered high performance spaces arenas let's say how what would google campus look like and where should it locate urbanistically etc this for me are the, the, the real hard difficult question on the frontier similar to what you might have in medicine in terms of gene therapy and 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 and, and, and in relationship to to, to certain complex um, um, uh, um, diseases and, 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 and researches versus when, when these kind of questions come, it is like, uh, you know, saying there is huge problems, there is not enough penicillin uh, in, in, in Africa and, and children dying because there is there isn't basic services which have been discovered and known about since 100 years. I haven't arrived there yet. So uh, because it has to do with medical uh, services, it is a question for medicine or certain problems of, of, of third world uh, shanty towns where haven't, they haven't arrived yet, a kind of basic modernist condition uh, which they're still working on, some slum clearing which we've done 60 years ago where, where, you, where you, put, you put out a battery of concrete um, 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 uh, dwellings and put electricity and, 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 and flowing water into this as if this was the urgency we should all discuss and since it didn't solve, we, we, we should stop discussing arcane kind of questions of, of formal repertoires, aesthetics and, and, and the kind of micropolitics of, for instance, what I find, of let's say a Google headquarters. I think that's where the problem is. And we have to be, grow that thick skin and we have to feel good about saying that discussion isn't where, where, where the discipline should focus its energies because we're, we're about ro rolling out the next level of the civilization in terms of built environment. And of course, there is this, 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 the, the, the world develops in an asynchronous way but this is not our problem. Of our, that is socio-economic, political problem, de development, uh, modernization uh, uh, concepts which are discussed on many, many levels. Uh, primarily economics <coughs> discourses, and still there's not a, there's going to be a solution anyway for this. We're only talking about trades of not solutions. I would argue in principle as a headline. So that's where I would stand yeah. and and kind of not defend the particulars of this. Yeah, but but defend the, 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 the lack of popular appeal of this discourse. Yeah, but okay, I'm look, <laughs> but you're making a political statement. I'll give the microphone away after this. Yeah. You're making a political <laughs> statement that the architecture is meant to be highly elitist and that it can't somehow reach an audience that has a broader base and basically can't have democratic input. You're saying it should only be for a panel right, to I'm decide what the Google headquarters I'm defending looks like. a, a research frontier. A research frontier. So, so let, well, let's, Patrick, let's, I, 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 where I disagree with you is that I don't think the frontier is constructed out of architecture theory. And I think if you do that, I think architecture will have very little relevance. I think the frontier is out there. And I think, let's say, if I were to use an example of the grouping of the historicists, for instance, um, I would say that my generation is returning to history, I think less from the way, Alejandro, that you describe, is an image of resistance to newness, is a resistance to the, the, the smoothing tectonics of the computer. No, I think it is more operative than that. I think why we look 
uh, perhaps into history, into context, is in a way to look at certain common ideas, certain persistent architectures that has been sanctioned by use and by time. And if they are sanctioned by use and by time, it means also that those ideas and those architecture has a certain continued relevance in an any urban context in which, ar in which architecture operates in. And it is in that task of the architect, therefore, to learn from this, uh, from this observation, right? And by learning in this observation, we are also, in a way, uh, confronting, in a sense, the rate of urbanization and change in which in, in which liberal, uh, liberal econ um, neoliberal economy is, is, is rotting so much uh, anxieties in the city, right? So in the sense that by looking at history, one could find moments to regulate this change, right? And, 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 and to soften perhaps the, the, the impact of, of development, of change that people feel so anxious about. But she's asking yep. you or she's asking us how history, which yes. is so I'm using collective, his... collective memory of uh, tests that have yeah. been done before us yeah. can represent or can address the problem of the migrant crisis. No. I, 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 I understand her question as how in which architecture is relevant. Right? So I, and I, where I agree with Patrick is that architecture must be relevant through its internal discipline. I completely agree on that point. But where I don't agree with you, Patrick, is that I don't think the frontier and in which leads to certain architectural relevance is constructed out of theory. I think it is constructed out of the field in which architecture <coughs> operates in. Well, reflected in theory, I mean, through... For instance, I would not approach the problem of urbanization as a continued discussion of, of uh, Collage City to Jane Jacobs to Leon Korea and so on. I would look, look out and look at sure, perhaps but these issues that... that that you are talking about, you know, but I would talk about no, it. No, of course, but the, the theory is not never in a vacuum. So we have prospective and retrospective manifestos, but we have a reflective discourse. We, we're not just, uh, um, uh, you need to mediate, discuss, evaluate, select, project phenomena you observe. I mean, Ram for me is a great one who has been a, a, a great empiricist, but at the same time, he's a theorist. But if you just look and at learning the, the, from Las Vegas if, if and Jane you, Jacobs as an empiricist become a theorist. No, I understand. But if you yeah. if if you look at the propositions that you put on the table all the time, and I listen to you so many times in public <laughs> debates and so on, it's always about the smoothing of tectonics. And that is because there is a niche that you're arguing from collagity to deconstruction to the Lusian space. I I think the public has very little interest in this. Well, but that's to be expected. You should have interest in it. No, we don't. I have interest in I I have interest in it, but not the only interest. No, but I, I, look, I, I I think I I respectfully I would say, Patrick, that I think that position is an old position. I think the materialist form fetishist is a date oh. of, of form fetishist of a mediated architecture which which sold on a global stage is an old modality. And I think the new modality is about a systems approach which addresses real social issues and we have to integrate this. And this does, is not a denial of profession. It is about embracing a new profession which allows us to be able to deal with actually the social issues. And there's as much innovation to deal with the immigration crisis as it is to deal with the, with the Google campus. I think it requires a different modality and a different responsibility and a different behaviors. So I think it's the two. And I think th th this kind of slightly fetish, fetishization of polarization is kind of an outdated modality when you talk about things being interdependent. So I do think these issues are important, and I think the pol political act is important. So dealing with these big issues is an important act, and I think we have to take responsibility. And this is not about, and the real issue is that there is no architectural theory. Let's put that on the table. I there think is. Most, no, there no, is. No, no, okay, this is, let, let me say my bit. I think there is no architectural theory. I think architectural theory is largely interpretist bullshit. <laughs> which actually doesn't relate to a lot of the socio-economic stuff. So you want to read really good stuff? Read stuff that's going on out there. I think the impoverishment of the architectural intellectual has been a long-term issue. And I accept I think, that. Right? I agree we, with that. We don't have enough PhDs which are doing real groundbreaking work about the performative impact of architecture. So the real issue is that we are, we are like elephants on heels of data. We are elephants on heels of data. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, Last question because uh, we are being uh, told to. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. I, ex um, I accept the theoretical level of the discipline is abysmal, absolutely abysmal. Uh, well, 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 one second, one second. <laughs> a, a tiny 
question because I, I'm really happy that you point out this uh, aspect. I think it's a really good point. Thank you, a woman, by the way. <laughs> Young, pretty totally woman. Totally relevant. And, and yes, we are a discipline that is totally endogamic, and that's our main problem. We are talking about our things, and we are not even engaging with this part. That's your point, no, Anif? And, and this is our main problem. We can say, oh, we would like to deal with, our, with uh, politics, but talking about our main things and, and not uh, talking about things, for example, that uh, to really address the, the common uh, good, uh, we need to be a lot of people doing things together. You have described it like in three parts. And architecture is full of egos, individuals talking about themselves. So it's impossible to, to work together to, to really engage with, with this other part of the society. So your point is really good. Just to finish, and we have to go, I'm sorry. <laughs> we will send you a message. Uh, since this is the last question, I'll make it very short. I mean, it's been a fantastic conversation, and I've really enjoyed listening to everyone. And actually, I think the diagram is a great diagram because it's created a wide range of debate. But I'll really, my question really starts from the early conversation from Indy when he was talking about issues of the larger politics, the race, and those kind of issues. What I feel has been lacking in this debate is how the larger politics affect the architectural fraternity. Most of the conversation has been your influence on architecture and changing things. What do you think, and what's your views in terms of where the politics is going now, today? Your Donald Trump, yeah. what's happening with Europe? How is that influencing your debate, this conversation? Yeah. Well, I, you know, I, I don't know whether, whether we can resolve Donald Trump and, and Europe in architecture, we are affected by, by it. But I tell you, and, and that also is a, uh, my, my answer to, to your question of how architects can engage with, uh, um, with uh, the world that, out there. And, I, and this is also something to, to kind of challenge Patrick about saying, oh, the question of the windows is a, is a matter of engineering. I think that and this is a kind of old project of mine that I, I tell you how it will affect, it is a kind of architectural project that will affect the world. If we were, you, you know what, what is happening now with the, the building regulations, like building frames are becoming fatter and fatter and more and more plastic, and, and uh, uh, the walls are becoming thicker and thicker because we have to put increasing amounts of, of insulation, and windows are becoming smaller and smaller. Uh, because of the regulations that affect architecture for, archi Scrap for architecture to perform uh, eff effectively and consume less, less energy. So all these things that are happening automatically because of increasing environmental uh, performance of, uh, of buildings have an aesthetic effect, which is right against the, the way we have been educated to think about architecture. We like thin or no metal frames, all transparent uh, walls, and so on and so forth. That's, that has been the previous canon of architecture. Now, I think that the best thing that architects could do for this world today is to make thick frames and small windows cool. <laughs> Aesthetic. If we, could, if we were able to do that, we will, we will make a huge service to mankind. And I think architects have the, the capacity to do that. That we've done it historically time and again. And we are just not, uh, not uh, being able to, die. I don't know exactly how I would solve the, the, the migrant crisis, but I, I think that there are certain things out there that I can try to solve with architecture. And I, I think that now they are important and politically loaded. And whether Patrick thinks are engineer or not, I, I see them as opportunities to do architecture. And, and, and I think that's, that's the way uh, we, we can contribute to, to and we can uh, have a political, a, a true political agency. I mean, can I just very briefly answer? <laughs> I mean, because I, you, your conception of aesthetic is exactly mine. So aesthetic revolution is required to, to make the pragmatically viable 
high performance or necessary, uh, accept it as an, as an aesthetic and didn't make it desired. So I accept that element of this, of the equation. <laughs> But I don't accept the thick frames and the small windows um, because they're coming through. <laughs> because there's not only a cost element, there's a benefit element we need to consider. consider. But that's a, that's a longer discussion. Can I just say something? Just a, yeah, 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 I think um, I think it's a really valid question you made about the kind of where where how is architects reach out and engage with society. I, I would see this conversation as a kind of internal review, a kind of party game within a kind of call. You know, an internal review for architects, and I think architects are very heavily engaged in in, in um, reaching society. And I think there's a kind of domain in which we can be more effective than others. And so, I'm not sure architecture can solve the Syrian war and the migrant crisis that resulted from it. But actually, you know, when it comes to how to um, uh, house and integrate uh, refugees or asylum seekers, then then actually you know, it's incredibly pertinent and incredibly valid. And there's no opposition between being engaged in those um, issues and, say, looking to history for your models of architecture, because actually history can t take you very, very good models of how to build a, a, a space that's not just a stack of boxes, but actually allows people to live together really well and integrate into a host community. So I think it's absolutely pertinent and absolutely valid, and there's absolutely no opposition between say, work that might be characterized as historical and therefore, I don't know, all the pejoratives that are usually given to that as backward-looking, inward, self-reflective or whatever is entirely engaged with um, very pertinent social issues. Okay, I think that we are really now uh, under pressure to leave. Thank you very much. For <laughs>